everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Rumcast. This is the podcast that talks all things rum related with the people who love and shape it. We got a really cool interview in this episode with Jason Zeno from Porchdown Distillery. They are the makers of Cherami rum, which is a fresh cane juice rum from Louisiana that we've mentioned a number of times on the podcast. But uh, yeah, I wanted to finally sit down and talk to Zeno, tell you the whole story behind it, everything they've got going on there. Just a fun conversation about rum in general. But John, before we get into that, what's been going on with you down there in Miami? I know you've been pretty busy fighting through some illness <laughs> and everything, but you're you're yeah. back. We just got through recording a great episode. What's been going on with you down there? Yeah, it's the it's the busy time of year for us here, uh, and uh, in between all of that, you know, dealing with kids going back to school and picking up a cold here and there, and just yeah. going around the house. So not as much time to uh, to drink as much lately. But I was able to, in between sicknesses here, attend a pretty cool event, Will, here in Miami that I wanted to mention. So this was the uh, Miami for Maui event that Esotico Miami, the bar here, a rum bar that's pretty famous. I think a lot of people know about Esotico here mm-hmm. uh, in Dallas downtown Miami. They did this event a few weeks back, Miami for Maui, which is in recognition of the rough time they had in Lahaina there with the hurricane and the fires that came from that. And they wanted to uh, get people together, do a fundraiser, and just kind of know that, you know, that Maui's in all of our thoughts, and especially uh, for those of us who are in Miami as well. So I was lucky enough to be able to uh, attend that event. Uh, It was a really, really nice event where we got to see a lot of performances that were uh, from people that came all the way, some of them from Hawaii, Oh, wow. do, I didn't realize uh, that they so, yes. traveled all the way from there. That's amazing. S- some of them did. And then others, I think, were local or nearby local sure. that, that are Hawaiian heritage and also did some performances as well. So there was really great entertainment amongst the food and the drink. There were cocktails that uh, were made uh, there for, for the event. And many of them were excellent, some of which I hadn't been able to try before. As we've talked often, I'm not super into cocktails as much as uh, others are. But it gave me a basis. It was kind of a, like an open bar concept they gave you a menu and okay. you could order whatever you wanted as part of this event. Oh, nice. And that was super cool. What was, uh, what'd you, what'd you grab off the menu? Do you, do, so, were these like classic cocktails or were they cocktails made specifically like unique recipes for this event? What was that kind of looking like? I think it was a mix of both because okay. there was definitely That's some, the way like to some go. Hawaiian That's the way to go. slanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I had a, uh, funny enough, I think I had an uh, El Dorado three daiquiri on the way okay. in that had some pineapple juice in it also. So it was a little bit of a, a Hawaiian style daiquiri, but using Eldo, and uh, which is actually great, and we've talked about that in the past. And then also I had a Hawaiian Mai Tai, okay. which was slightly different in the specs than the Mai Tai. I'll have to put it in the show notes. Kind of like the, the classic Hawaiian version with like some pineapple juice and that sort of yes. thing in it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was uh, along those likes, which I thought was excellent as well. Uh, and then some other things that, you know, throughout the night, honestly, frankly, I don't even remember at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was a fun event. And talking to great people, uh, you know, some of the bigger... Uh, uh, rum brands were also there. Bacardi, Plantation, um, Diplomatico were also in, in, in presence there. And so, you know, just uh, hanging out with some people from Miami, having a good time, drinking some rum. I got to go with, of all people, Will, my sister. My wife couldn't make it. So I, I went with my sister, Kimberly, who uh, she's Why, why, not... why do you say of all people? Is it, do, well, you, do, you, do you guys like secretly not like each other? What is no, no, no. <laughs> well, I, I love my sister very much. Uh, she's my younger sister, but she's not into spirits or rum at all. Okay. 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 So I when I asked her to go, I was kind of like, you know, it was kind of a, uh, well, my wife can't go. And, you know, I don't get, I hadn't seen her in a while. As I mm-hmm. mentioned, it's, everybody's busy this time of year. And so I asked her and she was like, to my surprise, sure, I'll go. So she got to try some drinks that, uh, you know, some of which I ended up drinking for her <laughs> because she was a little too strong and then sure. others that she actually really did enjoy and she found uh, a liking for. So there was some cool other people there too, like uh, the person that represents Aquapana. Have you ever heard of this, Will? Aquapana water? I, I, I'm seeing it like you forwarded me in an email they sent out uh, yeah. about this event and it has all the sponsors at the bottom and I'm seeing Aqua Pond. It's like it's part of uh, San Pe- Pellegrino, apparently. I've yes. not heard of this water. Yeah, uh, Aquapana I encountered the first time when we took a trip to Italy, and it's uh, oh, an okay. Italian, just natural water. It's not a sparkling water. Uh, okay. It's in from the Tuscany region. I and did not encounter I that just, when I was in Italy, but I also didn't get out to Tuscany, so that might be why. Yeah. It's it's a premium product essentially. It comes in a glass bottle. It's wonderful. Anyway, I'm diving way down into a. a it sounds a like a commercial hole. for for Aquapana, our new sponsor on the Rumcast. Apparently, 
<laughs> but he was a cool guy from Italy. So um, just a lot of uh, a good night. They'd, and they ended up raising over six thousand dollars, I believe. Yeah, uh, that's for, that's awesome. So it was a, it was a fun night, and you know it's nice to be in a place where we have these type of events happening every so often and get to be a part of them. So for sure, um, no, that's that's great to see. I mean, uh, the wildfire situation in Lahaina is so so tragic to see. Yeah. I actually, the first Mai Tai I ever had was in Lahaina because my wife and I were there for a honeymoon. This was back in 2012. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so in, any any way to support what's happening there is a great thing to do. So shout out to Esariko for, for making that happen. And um, yeah, if you can, I don't know, there's, there's a number of organizations doing great things with donations over there. If, if, if you can afford to, to give a little, it's a great cause to give to right now because really devastating wildfires that happened there. And so, yeah, big shout out to Asadiko for putting that together. But with that said, John, I'm, I'm excited for this interview. We actually just finished doing this close to two hours just because I, there, there were so many interesting things to talk about. And yeah. Zeno does a little bit of everything with Jeremy. Uh, I mean, his, his background is in distilling, so obviously he's very active in distilling, but does a lot of stuff on the, you know, the business side as well, trying to grow it and everything. So we talked a lot about, you know, uh, we get into a lot of nerdy rum production stuff, but also the business of rum, the category of Louisiana rum, introducing people to cane juice rum, just uh, a a lot of stuff. And I I think, you know, they're, they're kind of a unique distillery in the U S right now because um, a, they're all cane juice B they make it on a scale. That's a lot larger than any of the other, cane juice rum producers in the u.s uh which which is you just don't see very often someone making that big of an investment into cane juice rum so they're they're really serious about it creative approach to production you know they make three different kinds blanc they make a slightly different kind of rum for aging that's a little Mm bit uh more you know a little funkier i would say to kind of stand up to the wood they also do a queen share so there's just a, you know, they're just an interesting American rum distillery right now. And uh, I was excited to, to, to get Zeno on and, and hopefully people can learn a little bit more about what's going on down there in Louisiana. Yeah, it, it feels to me kind of like they might be one of those distilleries that's on the edge of a, a sort of a larger breakthrough. Just I'm not sure exactly what to point to, but after speaking with Zeno on it and just feeling like it's the presence is going to continue to grow from them. Yeah. Uh, and then just hearing all the stuff that they went through to get to where they are now uh, is also supremely interesting. So I, I agree with you. I think in general, what we talk about Louisiana rum a lot, and it's nice to hear from a Louisiana rum producer who's so committed to what yeah. they are doing and the vision of what they're doing and, and hopefully continuing to see success from it. For sure. Yeah, well, as I said, uh, this is a this is a full interview. You know, we went deep on this, yeah. so we're gonna we're gonna keep the intro nice and tidy under ten minutes on this episode, and go ahead and take a quick break and get right over to the interview. All right, we're here with Jason Zeno, head distiller. Head, head distiller is not your does not encapsulate everything you do, as as we were just saying. Head of operations is that the more appropriate title? What what Man. are you calling yourself these days? I don't I don't know. I'm Chief spreadsheet like, maker. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it, we're, we're such a small company. It's a team. Everyone, every drop of rum that comes out of our facility, every part, every person has a part in it. So. At the end of the day, I guess I'm the last line of defense if something's terrible. You're the okay. immune system then. You're I'm the, the person immune system. You're the person to blame if there's a problem with anything. Right. Um, I'm liking I'm liking product officer, chief product officer. That's okay. a fun that's Sounds a fun, like you work at a software company. The CPO. Yeah, right. you're the CPO. <laughs> I have a lot of tech friends, so I'm like yeah. stealing. You put a three there. in there and now we got something. It's C three PO. The the C three PO. Because want- operating operations is kind of like now that there's this realm of operations is more like marketing and sales planning. Right, 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 right. So I'm like, okay, and like I'm not technical officer because like we're a distillery, but in reality, I'm probably all of those and the guy who picks up garbage and um, does the podcast interviews, right? Does podcast during, interviews during the busiest yeah. time of the year? It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. On the note of official introductions and everything, I feel weird introducing you as jason zeno because i've literally never heard anyone call you jason ever yeah when did you stop being jason and switch fully over to zeno um here's a fun story were you zeno as a baby like i can't can't imagine you as jason 
right or without a beard yet here i stand before yeah you showed up Ah. on the on the zoom call like you know completely Completely shaven shaven. it was it's a good look though you look like you're you know ready to go into this harvest season and like kick some ass i feel like i look like a jaundiced homer simpson um But yeah, I'm just not, I don't care for it. Actually, every time I do this, I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> I'm like, except uh, it would be more, don't. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I want to f- fade slowly back into the hedges. Um, <laughs> so when did I become Zeno? Fun story. Not really. Um, my dad was Zeno. Uh, okay. Uh. So he was Zeno and he died in my early 20s. And a family friend looked at me and was like, that's your name now. Wow. And mm. pretty much from then on, I have gone by that. Everyone, my family, my daughter, my wife, everyone except for my immediate family. And most, they call me Jay a lot. So really, okay. if you call me Jason, it's like, eh, yeah. I, yeah. Really, I don't, I don't really care. My dad used to have a saying, because I'm a big sports fan too. He's like, the man doesn't, or the number doesn't make the man. The man makes the number. Mm. I take the same approach with names. I'm like, I don't care what your name is. Be a good person. Right. Um, yeah. so. It's like if you're good enough at whatever sport, you can be like number 67 and make it cool somehow. Right. I was 68, Will. <laughs> I was. <laughs> yeah. I was. True story. Yeah. It's mine now. 68 forever. Yeah. <laughs> that, you, you know, the, the other aspect of that too, Zeno is an Ellis Isle name. Like, oh, really? It, yes. Uh. So I'm... A weird. I'm from Pittsburgh, which is the, I'm like. What are you? I'm I'm a Yinzer, um, because I am. My grandmother was Italian. She married a French Canadian guy from Quebec. Uh huh. And then my dad's side is all Polish. So I'm like, yeah, that's just someone from Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, <laughs> and but like when when my grandparents, like my great grandfather, he came over and I made my grandfather before he passed away tell my wife this story i was like when they came he got off the boat or whatever and they're like his name was jimma mm-hmm. and they're like well that's too weird to, pr- to pronounce we don't know that and at the time there was zeno bubblegum z-e-n-o bubblegum wow mm. and it was like so it, that that's where zeno's derived from so i'm like here i am it's like you know that's my name that's what you know me as i'm like oh yeah it's bubblegum it has it's no bubble meaning gum. whatsoever yeah which is that's great. cool i love that yeah. Sometimes I'm, I'm I'm a little jealous of the, the the generations that got the the cool new Ellis Island name because I you know my ancestors just stuck with Hookinga which is you know it's a it's it's a I mean, little bit of a burden in terms of you know getting sure. people to pronounce it and then the the other aspect of it is my grandmother on on that side my my dad's mother her maiden name was Van Lair which is a, I always thought a really cool sounding last name, and B, extremely easy to pronounce. You never have to teach anyone how to say that. But uh, yeah, so hooking a much to my wife's chagrin is 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 where we've landed. You sound like that. The Van Lair sounds like a vampire hunter. I know. Too, yeah. Like, yeah. It's like it's, it's got the Van Helsing man. quality yeah, like to it. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Yeah. But well, I don't know. I mean, Will, I think you should be proud that you know. Ellis Island names are kind of like a bastardization of your whole culture, and it's true. Who you it's are, true. So, I yeah. Mean, it's kind of not great. Yeah, um, there's often some 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 racism baked baked into the decisions to change. Yeah, yeah so. right. I mean, how many Polish jokes have you heard? Right, I'm a lot. Walking, living Polish joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it, it's it's funny. But yeah, that you know, you know about my name like that. It's you know, I have vendors or something. I'm like, oh yeah, it's looking for Jason. I'm like, okay. It's a it's a real quick way for me to tell like this person hasn't talked to me before. Right, right. You don't know me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On on the 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 subject of origin stories, I, I I would love for listeners to get to hear how you were making I know you've done other stuff besides this, but prior to what you do now, one of the things you did was making whiskey at Jim Beam, I believe, in Kentucky. How do you go from that completely different spirit, very large company to yeah. moving to louisiana and making cane juice rum i wanted a free trip to new orleans um <laughs> that's a good i mean start. that's that's the truth of it that's how that happened so first and foremost i beam suntory especially the suntory side and some of the japanese folks and the scottish folks and the irish folks that i worked with i freaking loved mm-hmm. um 
even some of the cruise and stuff, which we're on the rum podcast, so let's talk about that. I mean, that's part of the brand. That was pretty neat. Did you get to go down there at any point in the Virgin Islands? I, I did not, but a lot of my – the so they had the big storm when I was there. It was devastating, and a lot of the maintenance team went down, and they came up here, and they worked there. It's great. Um, it's not my style of rum. It's cool. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. They do a ton. Yeah. Probably yeah. that we never even get to see. And, I, you know, they're part of the inspiration of, like, you can pry barrels on my cold, dead hands. Um, <laughs> what, do they hold on to theirs for a, uh, a super long barrels time? barrels forever. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, you, we, I don't know. We'll get too deep into that. But so how did I how did I decision that? So I wasn't any under contract or anything, and I didn't, I didn't need any pay back any bonuses or anything like that to, to Beam Suntory at the time. And I saw this job posting, and – in New Orleans, and I was like, hmm, I've never been to New Orleans. Oh, and you hadn't been there at all? Like, even a mm-hmm, quick, you know, mm-hmm. bachelor nope. party, nothing? Nope. So I was like, let's let's check this out. I'm kind of curious. I think I know what this place is because our industry is very small in reality. Like, everyone knows everyone. Mm-hmm. You're may, at most two degrees separated from almost every distillery in the, in the yeah. country, right? Yeah, yeah. So... Talked to them, had a good uh, interview, and I'm like, okay, this is kind of a good idea. Their main thing was like the facility here in New Orleans that we operate right now. And then at that point, we had one in a place called Thibodeau, which is a cool area of the world that is totally different than anything I've ever been to. More rural, right? Yes, more rural, way very close to the cane. It's awesome. That's where you want to eat boudin, gumbo, Mm, catfish. Yeah. Yeah. That's where you want to go. Well, one of the many places you want to go. Sure. Okay, it has good stuff, too. And everywhere, it's funny. It's like, you know, to, you know, go off talking about food, but, like, New Orleans has amazing food. They do, yeah. It's not the Cajun food that I eat the most here. That I get in the other parts of Louisiana. Interesting. Um, you, took, you took me to an awesome little taco place for lunch uh, when I was down there. Oh, you know, yeah. Taco Taqueria show. Guerrero. Yeah. yeah. Can we plug Taqueria Guerrero? Yes. Taqueria yeah. Guerrero. <laughs> Check it out. The salsas they had there yeah. were incredible. Yeah. Yeah, they have. Uh, they actually have like soccer nets, like soccer kits that say Taqueria Guerrero, and he oh, gave me awesome. one because nice. I'm in there because you know I'm a fat kid and didn't grown up into a fat adult that I just <laughs> right. I'm in there once a week, right? And that um like at least and yeah, they're great people, family run and amazing Taqueria. Anyways, so I was like, yeah, free trip to new orleans let's check it out so my wife and i they flew us down here got you know the conversation on that and i you know i look for an opportunity or new challenge or something interesting Mm. Uh, beam is great you know you're a tiny part of a huge system yeah yeah um and you know you can get a bigger part of that as your career progresses and that was happening for me but really it's thibodeau and the sugar cane that really that i was like oh yeah yeah this is a big opportunity here. So did you, we did to, you know, go like was rum on the horizon going into oh, yeah. it? Cause I, I know you didn't start out making that at mm-hmm. porch jam. hundred percent rum was always going to happen. Okay. Like, like I wouldn't, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't have come here if it wasn't, if it was just vodka, mm-hmm. which let me tell you the vodka that we made for a while and still have some is still make some. It's, it, it's great, but vodka is, Someone said it's a fist fight every day. And um, why is that? A, really? Trying to sell it in the competitive market. Uh, and yeah, it's really yeah, sold okay. on, on price and brand mm-hmm. more. And what do I give a shit about is the liquid, mm-hmm. right? Right, Which right. doesesn't really matter that much, especially in vodka. It right. does. And there's nuance to it. And it's a beautiful spirit in and of itself. But, right, I don't, I'm not selling it to guys on a rum cast. I'm selling it to. <laughs> Everyone who wants to taste cranberry juice. So, <laughs> so you know, I, that wasn't enough for me to, to, to buy in the Thibodeau, the second facility that was like in the middle of a cane field. I was like, okay, I could see something going on here. So all rum was going to happen there. Okay. So, yeah, it started with a free trip. And I was like, you know, they they made an offer and I took a risk. And here I am five plus years later. So yeah. that's how I transition now. Like the work itself, like I said, it's way more creative control. Yeah. Right. So it's great. It's also stressful because I do more business things, which I hate. 
Um, I hate the marketing. I hate the branding. Mm. I hate the self-promotion and arrogance and all of that. The low barrier of entry is say that I'm a master distiller or master blender. I'm like, anyone can say that. I don't say those things. I never want to say those things because right. I never want to be a master of them. Mm. Right? Because I'm constantly trying to find out yeah. new information. Like, well, what if I try this? And let me tell you, it doesn't work sometimes. But yeah. uh, I really love like the blending aspect of things is there's all kinds of ways you can do it. But I'm really, rum really leans itself to that. And it's and you've had some things that are blended, Will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, on that note, when you say rum really lends itself to blending, on on the one hand, I'm like, well, you know, blending is a much more accepted standard practice in rum, and my mind is going, is it because there's something about rum that makes it easier to blend than something like whiskey, for example, or is it just because there's a an established sort of tradition of blending in rum that you know, is less common in, in some other spirit categories. What, like, what is it? Is it, is, is there something about rum that makes it easier to blend than other spirits? I think my answer is yes to all of your, yeah. everything <laughs> you said, well, I mean, is it easier? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's easy. I think that there's enough variation. I think that you're, you're typically, even if you're using new Oak, you can have two barrels, the same exact liquid right next to each other. They'll be different in yeah. any spirit, mm -hmm. right? You know, Jim Beam, Jim Beam, like white label is consistent, not because the whiskey coming out of those barrels is super consistent. I assure you it's not. It's very good, actually. Jim Beam, just out of straight out of barrel for your whiskey, is amazing. What you see in a bottle is a lot lighter because it goes through a lot of processing and filtering and mm -hmm. yeah, those yeah. kind of things. So that's how they get consistency there. So I think it's a consistency thing that you do with rum. It's... It allows you some degrees of freedom in your in your flavor profile if you kind of know what pieces you're working with. And then there's the regulatory thing. There's not a ton of rules with rum that you could do that. So you're like, hey, you know what? Um, great example of this is I had a friend come in and I got some different barrels. that had some different whiskey in them. And I knew the history of the cooperage and there were seasoned staves. And I was curious. I was like, let's try these. They're only like three or four months old. And we pull, we thieve some out of one of these barrels. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I would drink this right now. Yeah. Right. And that's a great blending tool. I'm like, so a four month old, right. And I keep using that barrel, maybe mm -hmm. blended with something that I have that's three and a half years old or something like that. You can do those kind of things. And it's less looked down upon in rum because we're not hung up on age is synonymous with quality. And, you know, there's always bad actors, right? Mm -hmm. You can put, I guess I shouldn't say 23 in a barrel. That's pretty clearly calling them out, right? <laughs> People use that example all the time. Yeah, so I mean, you but, but wouldn't be the fine. first. And that's, no, that's one fine, no one that's will a, know. That's a fine product. But like, I mean, I'm not huge into age statements or anything like that. I mean, you mm -hmm. can tell people the age of the product in there, like what's the make of it. And we are doing that. We just wrote some copy for my age expression coming out now. And it's clear. It's like nothing's less than two years in that first one. I'm really yeah. But um, it, it, yeah, it, it, there's just like there's degrees of freedom there's control there's the solera influence mm -hmm. which you know i'm a big fan of, uh, of right so and, and the profile of the spirit is maybe a, a oddly less abrasive than some whiskeys so you can get some notes that are more subtle to point out and, and, and blend and there's a very very influenced by you know french and, and wine i i have a huge wine influence mm -hmm. as a lot of rum makers do i know you've had maggie on here before she's yeah. a huge wine influence yeah, right like for sure blending you always i mean you blend right and so calvados is my favorite spirit in the world probably mm. and you know how many like single varietal apple calvados there are I don't None. really know of any. Yeah, because like it doesn't like you wouldn't do that. I don't see any. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that's like you're making that and you're talking about different apples for it, right? Let alone different barrels. But there's there's lots of reason to do, but you know, I I didn't have a ton of that experience because I didn't blend a lot of whiskeys. It's bleeding itself more into American whiskey. Mm. I was around when I don't know if you're familiar with like Little Book, which I don't was know Little Book. It was Freddie Knows. It's like his his project. I remember when he came up with it, he wanted to blend whiskeys that were in a similar profile to what the green bill was, like in the ratios. Okay. So like a corn, 
a rye and a malt. Mm-hmm. So the first one was like some variation of that. And then also in American whiskey, blending used to be a derogatory term. Yeah. That's where you got the whole bottle of bond and antifreeze and like, what the yep. hell are you actually drinking? So yep. there is a, there is a it's different spirit, different rules. Now I wish well, and you know, even today, like, you know, blended scotch is kind of the, you know, look down have the same reputation. Yeah. As, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Even though you know, there's perfectly great blended scotch. Absolutely. Right. Compass yeah. box makes some amazing things. Right. Yeah. yeah. And there are others, many others. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, but it just, it just, you know, it, the market dictates a lot of those things, but rum is just, I don't know. Probably people that listen to this will care about the blend and the blending of rum, but some people, you know, and then there's the single barrel aspect. I'm, I've never been huge on single barrels and just cause it's a single barrel. doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. Right. Right. If you're like, Oh, I picked one out cause I think it's exceptional. It doesn't mean how much am I allowed to swear on here? Cause I, you know, I swear as much lot. as you want, go for it. Okay. All right. So like, yeah, <laughs> so I'm like, I don't give a shit about single barrels. And even if I think one is exceptional, that's, you know, my perspective with my genetics, my organoleptic perception. That's not exactly what everyone thinks. So everyone speaks to some, someone else in their single barrel. We've sold some single barrels that in Minnesota, actually, there was a few of them. Mm-hmm. And I did a market visit there. It was really cool how these barrels spoke to these people. Yeah. And it made me approach them from a different perspective. And I was like, oh, yeah. And then I remembered the barrel. What was in, like, I could look it up. I have the barrel code. Because I have a lot of, I keep as much data as I can. Spreadsheets. Um, it all goes back yeah. to the spreadsheets. Spreadsheets, you know. <laughs> right, hey, man, I measure relative humidity and temperature in different parts of the warehouse. I know, yeah, yeah. Oh, you wow. showed me some of that before. It's cool. And I haven't I haven't plotted it yet. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this? It's sexy marketing bullshit science is what I say. <laughs> you so, yeah. mean you don't have a monitor with dynamic viewing of it at all times yet? <laughs> oh. I do. It's on my phone, actually. <laughs> yeah, I do have it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You're making, you're having a laugh, but like. <laughs> he really has reality. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of influence of my buddy Colton. He was like, you should get these. I'm like, yeah, I should get these. This would be fun. They're like, what do you do with that information, right? We're not yeah. big enough to really do it. The, the ch- difference in temperature is crazy and humidity, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we're talking about 10 to 15 degrees F and 10 to 15% relative humidity. Yeah. Which changed the dynamics of those barrel interactions immensely. Right. Sure. Now, I could probably tell that just by freaking tasting them or smelling them, but still that goes back to the whole blending thing. Like, like there's no way, right? And like beam consistency, and they'll tell you on their tours, right? Like they do a cross selection of a warehouse. Yeah. Right. So they get middle cut, top cut and everything, mm-hmm. and then they process it. But, but I don't have that luxury because I don't have millions of barrels. Yet. So I'm trying to, yet, <laughs> you're right. I'm trying to build in. I'm trying to build in. I'm a big fan of anyone can make something great once or maybe a couple of times. Do it over and over and over and over yeah. again. And I think that the way I'm aging and blending and, you know, we decide is going to build in some innate consistency. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, actually, so I, I know we went all around the world a little there, but I wanted to kind of hone back in on actually distilling and making the cane juice rum. Ah. I I, it, I saw an article where you were quoted as saying making a cane juice rum is a, quote, deliciously challenging pain in the ass. And now having spoke to you, that's very on brand as a statement. So what do you think are the most important things that you've had to figure out to create a high quality cane juice rum that maintains that deliciousness? And as you said, over time. I mean, I think a big part of it is, you know, there's the phrase that I say all the time that I stole from someone who probably stole from someone else. Is say true to fruit. We say true to fruit all the time. So like okay. so it's true to cane, right? right? So there's this essence of this cane and you're out in the field or you go to the mill. There's a continuity from when the juice comes in to when we make low wines to when we put the distillate to when we harvest barrels. Right. There is a common thread through there that we never want to lose. So sometimes it's, you know, I said earlier, I don't know if we were recording at the time, but managing a fermentation instead of trying to control fermentation. So you do it in your terms the best you can to get a profile that you like. So get out of your own freaking way a little bit sometimes. Uh, Don't you you can overthink it, but every little detail matters, right? The, The amount of fermentation, are you cold crashing it? The temperature profile the pitching rate, the nutrient rate, like how you do, but more importantly, where are you getting it? Where are you getting that juice? I think that 
the yeah. fact that I get as soon as it's pressed, it's harder to work with, right? There's a lot of total solids, but I wouldn't do it any other way at this point. And when you no say total ready. solids, you mean like cane fibers, yep. other mm-hmm. stuff that makes its way into the juice. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, like it's rinsed and then it's mixed with water and then they call it mixed juice at the mill. That's at that point. That's what they call it, which is mix sometimes from several mills and they, you know, they used water in the mill. Sorry, so it's a little diluted, but yeah. that's how they get the juice out or the sugar yeah. out. Yeah. And that's um, what I call most of my home drinks that I make. I just call mixed them mixed juice. juice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a cocktail. Someone should make a cocktail like that. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it, you know, and you've heard me say it before when I first started calling around, I got here, I'm like, why aren't more people doing this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This seems like a huge opportunity. A lot of them, the, cause it's hard to work with, right? Like yeah. it's yeah. going to spoil quickly. It's messy and you have to do it at some, like the doing the larger volumes easier. Like there's an easier way for me to do it and it's to build a distillery at the mill. Right, right. Which hopefully someday, Jeremy will will have its own mill, and, right, or be partnered with mill. Like yeah. I would mm-hmm. love that. That would make me happy. Um, sell the truck. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever sell that truck. I'm gonna get like buried <laughs> in that truck now. The um, truck will be part of the the tour. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's the tasting room. So we'll cut it in half. <laughs> yeah, cut right. it. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I have you know an imaginary amount of money, so I can do whatever exactly. I want. Yeah, so it, it, it's incredibly hard to work, but it's incredibly rewarding. And um, as in, I absolutely live for the smell of the cane wine. That's mm. my favorite part. I actually made a fortified cane wine with some queen share. I fortified it with some queen share. Really? Because, mm. Yeah, because I love the cane wine so much. It, I should have halted the, the fermentation more like a mistel, though, because it was a little too dry. And there's a lot of ash in uh, the Mississippi Delta, so there's a little salinity to it, which is nice. Everything in moderation, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. So that was, I went all over the place answering your question. But my thing is, is like the raw material would stay true to it, but also know, like I just said, there's a lot of ash. Be cognizant of what you're working with. And, you know, is it the yeast that we pitch that makes our, our rum specific is our flavor profile. No, I believe it's the microbiological flora that is in Louisiana. That's really, it's that blend and yeah. how we're managing it. Yeah. That really gets it. And then the distillation is a whole nother thing. It's like, okay, how much do we want to rectify this spirit? Yeah. And would right, you refer to that as terroir? Sure. You, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's terroir. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, there is, I did, some work with this i was uh, you know with different lactobacillus and lactobacilli and uh on malt and how that affects new make mm-hmm. whiskey mm-hmm. i think there's a lot to that because there's a lot of late lacto fermentation in and malt whiskey and in whiskey because they don't boil like in beer right or in even in in american whiskey there's late lacto which is is good to create long chain alcohols and character the congeners that are synonymous with some of the whiskeys that mm-hmm. we drink. Um, but the operable word there is late. And sometimes you can jump that proverbial shark, right? And you sour out and too much organic acid is you can go in the other direction. I so see. that's, it's a whole managing thing. And you're like, what am I talking about managing, right? Am I getting a microscope out and testing, looking at it every day? I'm like, whoa, and isolating <laughs> species. No, one, I'm not smart enough to do that Two. I don't know. You're throwing some some big words around. It's yeah, clear you went to school I, I, for this I, I shit. Agree. Like, yeah, you you might be underselling it. They're ten cent words, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's if you haven't gathered, I you know I you know you guys. It's like I love doing this. Yeah, I go to so I go make American whiskey and go somewhere. No, 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 I love this. The cane wine, and sometimes when we're doing like the stripping runs, and there's this slight caramelization in the pot. Mm. Chef's kiss, yeah, mm-hmm. right. That is just it's. I would in the last every year, every year of harvest, the last time we charge the stills, I make sure I'm like I need to smell it before I close the man man way like in the pot because it's my favorite smell. This is, I mean, this is what I hear people who have gone and visited four squares, like when they do their cane juice fermentations and distillations. Like every, people will not shut up about the smell, um, yep. even Richard it's Seale, like, yeah. It's like fruit and co- I don't like cotton candy, so I hate saying that, mm. but yeah, it's like uh, fruit and cotton candy. It is the most 
Mm. It's just, and it's like, it comes from a plant that's in my backyard, which is, you know, I couldn't do this in Pittsburgh. No offense yeah. to Tim. But Tim <laughs> listens to this because Tim makes amazing realms and he's my friend. Yeah. Shout um, out to t- Tim from Maggie's farm. I knew I'd bounce. The, I'd talk to him. I've talked to him way before I made rum. I, I was friends with Tim. So mm-hmm. who also you know, makes uh, amazing blueberry brandy that you uh, shared with me last time I was uh, yeah. at your distillery. Yeah, it was Falernum. Yeah. Was in, yeah, yeah. Falernum too. Yeah. Oh, I, his Falernum. I usually try and keep some in like in my fridge and I mix it with my yeah. rum all the time. Yeah. That and, uh, Capcore's Kinkina is what I mix with my rum. And now Colton's Terrativo is like, beer. yeah, that's it. That yeah. With my rum too. It's like a, a bourbon aperitif. It's really good. Hmm. And when I say mix it, that is being, I fill crushed. I fill rocks glass with crushed ice, probably rum to the same level as that ice. And then a little splash of one of these things. It's That's a, la- it's a as- lazy cocktail. Uh, we we yeah, did a whole episode like a, on our yeah. favorite lazy cocktails recently, and awesome. like that is the that's the classic formula for lazy cocktails: no shaking, no you know stirring. Really, you maybe slosh it around in the glass, and then it's ready yeah. to go. Yeah, I don't have, no I don't have time for that. I need I need rum now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it, yeah, I mean, I, I like I said, I absolutely love it. And, you know, I want. I wish I'm I'm working on things now so we can have some kind of consumer experience because my facility is very much not a consumer experience as a production. Well, I mean, you say that like it's it's a cool building to walk around in. I think when you say that, people are going to hear that it you know is not cool, but it's it's really just kind of it's kind of in an industrial setting, so it's a little right, hard it's not to get designed. Yeah, it's a little hard to get there. But like, if you're in there, like it's there's. I mean, you know, you got the barrels right there by the stills, yeah. and um, yeah. it's a it's a cool environment. You got. Uh, I don't know how often the dog is there, but you had a very cool dog there uh, when yeah, I was there. Yeah, Rue's there. Yeah, Rue. Yeah, yeah. Rue's awesome. Yeah, yeah. The um, yeah, the barrels are like in one side of the warehouse. They take over pretty much one side of the warehouse, and then. There's like the operations is actually a pretty small footprint. It's pretty condensed. Yeah. But, and then there's like packaging and processing. Yeah. I, yeah. I just don't have a taste in a bar and like, I like, right. talk, I can't even make lazy cocktails there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to crowdsource you a, uh, a, an easy bar that we can throw up in, in there somewhere and have at least a space that you can make a lazy cocktail on. Yeah. Or uh, I raise more money and just build a facility some like that, like an expand, right? There you go. You're yeah. growing, you're dying, guys. Come on. All aspiring investors listening, you know yeah. who to get in touch with. <laughs> yeah, right. It's you. All right. Yeah. So, well, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> so, Zeno, you, you've you've taken on the challenge now, right? You, you've come down to Louisiana. Uh, you, you know what you want to do. You're surrounded by cane everywhere there. So what does the process look like for finding and sourcing the fresh cane juice for you at that point is it a long process that you had to go through a bunch of different people find the right partner and then how did that all come together and how did you end up working with who you were working with as a source it's a great question it was very odd when i came down here because i knew at that time when i came here like johnny verplank was doing his thing with cane land mm-hmm. at that point and he yeah, did a little uh-huh. bit of raw juice but that made a ton of sense because Alma Plantation, right? They just did, they did their thing, and he's going out. I'm like, okay, well, I'm obviously not going to ask them for right. juice. And like the Thibodeau thing, kind of like we could never get full licensing for it, so that was that was iffy. And then we called myself and like you know my ace Davy there, who's the owner of Rue. <laughs> Him and I just called like every. Every mill that we could, you can go on like Louisiana Sugar Mill League or something. You can like against mm-hmm. their numbers. And, like I just called and cold called people. There's uh, a, thir- thirteen mills in the state. It was thirteen at that. I think it was thirteen at that time. I don't know. I just looked this up not that long ago because I had to give a presentation and it was like people might have merged or bought each other out yeah. or something like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. So I'll be honest with you. I don't keep an, a close eye on that. Uh, so I called them and some people were like not interested or didn't call me back or whatever and then the first time i did it was actually from a different mill and they gave it to me in like a five and like a thousand gallons in like two totes like square totes and i we i just hired a guy a u-haul to go pick it up 
which the better part of this story is that he didn't strap them down. So they fell on their side oh, on the back God. of a U-Haul and slid around. So they were wow. very hard to get out of a U-Haul truck. Um, <laughs> nothing is easy. So <laughs> right, we did this and I was like, okay, we fermented it, different yeast strain, different everything. I was like, proof of concept was the first time I ever did fresh cane juice from, right? Really liked the product. Ended up making a liqueur that was just for an R&D that we donated to something great. That was that harvest. The next before harvest, I called that same mill. They're like, oh, that was kind of a one-time thing. We don't really know how to sell this. And mm. <laughs> oh. I'm like, okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and I'm like, so I called. And I think now they actually are doing it for someone else. But uh, at that time, they weren't. So I called and called. And then Davey, um, whose last name actually happens to be Jeremy, um, name of the rum yeah right not well, that's, at all related a story there too right no not at all related not really i mean Jeremy is like in south louisiana it's kind of like smith okay really with the brand is the the Jeremy. it's more the dear friend element because my favorite aspect and our favorite aspect is the people and the social aspect and shit what we're doing right now right that's like it's dear friend sharing it with a friend for yeah. someone you, know, you love rum or you're gonna love rum now <laughs> right. So that aspect, it's more about that. It's what, it, with that name, you know, the literal translation okay. of it. It's not, we're not affiliated with one person. It's not called Zeno Rum. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. But he got, he got a whole day. It was taken, it was taken by the gum. So, yeah. You know, right. Out of yeah. luck there. Yeah. It's cease and desist by the bubble gum, that, <laughs> that company that died a long time ago. They, um, so Davey got a hold of the, 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 the mill that we currently use and, you know, Sheremy has a little more ring to it than Zeno in South Louisiana. Mm. Uh, as in, they know a bunch of Sheremys. Like, I know where you're from, right? So that's another reason kind of makes it. sense to do right. it, right? He's like, yeah, come down. I'll talk to you guys. So we went there, talked to you. He was like, yeah, whatever. I don't know how to, I don't know what to, I'll figure out a price for you. Did, that was in the off season for their, for them. So because, because just to, not to, sorry to interrupt, but, but just okay. to, to make clear for people, like this is not something mills are in the habit of selling right. at all um no no they're not they're not like they're so efficient at making sugar right, right. that's all um, they're thinking about is sugar yeah and they're like you know you want this the first mill that can do like, you want this it looks like mississippi mud water I, i've been quoted saying that a bunch of times like yeah it does and i'm like yes that's what i want that's exactly what i want right like i don't want any treatment to it at all not heat right, not, right? like a, like nothing so the, we walked we talked to them a couple times we walked through their like they walked us through the facility and like how the mill works and you know again off season and we talked about where to put a line in and they put in a line just for us um and it and it's right off it's exactly where we want it right as soon as it's pressed we're taking that juice and that was that that was the first year so they did it and then they were like Mm, we can fill your truck up faster. So they doubled the size of that line the next off season. So they can fill my, you know, 6,000 gallon truck in like 15 minutes. And it doesn't even remotely impact their business. Oh, cause they're just, it's so massive and making so much. Did you have the, I mean, logistically it's a, it's a truck with a big tank on the back of it. And so mm -hmm. you pull it in, they drop the line in there. It fills mm -hmm. up with cane mm -hmm. juice. And mm -hmm. then it's like a ticking clock to get it back, right? Because this is almost two hours away from where y'all are in New Orleans. So yep. did you have to, I mean, were there any logistics to consider in terms of, I, I, I don't know, just, it, it seems like it would be challenging to like, you know, transport it, get it back in time. Because the, the thing you always hear from cane juice rum producers is like, you have to use it quickly. You can't save it, you know, for a week or anything like that. Agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah, that was a lot of deliberation that first harvest, especially we, okay. Like where do we pitch these? Where are we allowed to pitch the yeast? Which mm, still TTB doesn't understand fermentation clearly. Um, because <laughs> as soon as that cane is cut, it's starting to ferment. And definitely when it's pressed, it's fermenting one way or another, mm, right? Right. Whether I add yeast doesn't, isn't starting fermentation. So you know, we talked about how, where to add that, how to add that, what temperature to add that at. Should we hydrate the yeast? Should we add a dry yeast? Should we mix slurry? Should we propagate yeast? Blah, 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 blah. Getting it back. Yes. 
it was my thought was, I was like, if I can do this in under three hours, I think I can do it. And yeah. I think I can. Did again, we mention how my... far away it is from, from the distillery? Yeah, it's about an hour and 50 minutes. When that truck and that full truck, it's a two hours. Good two okay. hours. So, you know, I'll tell this story because whatever you learn from your mistakes and thankfully no one got hurt. But the very first truck, they, I don't, we didn't open up or they didn't, open, there, there, it wasn't vented. Ah. So, and a tire blew. So it was sitting on the side of the road at like 95 yeah. degree weather right in Louisiana, fermenting intensely, yeah. right? And we got back, they couldn't open it, and they opened the vent, and it was like a train whistle that shot <laughs> cane juice. Oh, man. Like, like a cane juice 50, geyser. 50 feet in the air. Yeah, like my forklift was covered. I was like, well, <laughs> that'll never happen again. And it, it won't. Um I can see the so movie trailer right now. I can see the, <laughs> yeah. you know, with the like, there will be blood s- soundtrack playing right. in it. <laughs> yeah, right. I will drink your milkshake. Yeah. I have, <laughs> I, I have, uh, I have video of it. It's, uh, it's pretty Ooh. wild. Yeah. It, and, um, but, you know, what's funny about that is like the next trucks we got, obviously, that didn't happen again. And that's when I was, we were toying with different temperature profiles for the fermentation. I'm like, well, you know, longer cooler i'm like let's see what we can do out of that and really i like that first distillate from that first truck more oh. i liked the ester profile i'm like yeah. oh this makes a lot of sense when people were just cranking through this is a throughput game right faster faster fermentation like get through because you're you have a harvest season yeah right and which the harvest season in louisiana generally what october to january yeah, it's about 15 weeks. So okay. they are, they'll probably start milling this week. I think they are. I have it in my calendar, what he told me. But they'll start, they'll start uh, milling this week and then we will come in. We give them like a week or so to get lined out and I need the time anyways. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, we'll go until they say, hey, this is the last week that we're milling and I'll try and plan the last couple of trucks. And so just to give people an idea of what this looks like, it's literally just you're driving the truck there, getting the juice. I mean, not not you literally driving the truck. Someone is driving mm-hmm. the truck there, getting the juice, mm-hmm. taking it back to the distillery. You mm-hmm. guys start distilling, uh, and it just runs back and forth for 15 weeks? Well, depends on how many people I have and how much money I have. Yeah. In reality, right now with the equipment I have, I could do probably like three or four trucks a week. Mm-hmm. It's funny. The mill was like, "You're not bothering us till you're doing 30 trucks a day." Oh my <laughs> so, gosh! So, which is cool. That's my goal. Then, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to bother you. Well, you know, you got to sell it, making it. It's the easy part. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we get the truck back, fill the fermenters. We add a little nutrient. We do use a nutrient, um, and then kind of set the clock of. 36 hours from then we're distilling that to make our low wines. And then depending on how busy, usually we're trying to get a truck every other day. Like if we have enough people and money and everything like that, and we can run 24 seven and just the stills are always running and you're collecting a bunch of low wines because then you're making it more stable. Right. So basically you do, you do two distillations and you go ahead and knock out that first distillation and then you can wait before doing the second one because it's stabilized at that point. Right. Is that a correct way of looking at yeah. it? Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. For the most part, it's stabilized. Yeah, and then, I mean, I try to get to those. If we we don't wait to the end of harvest to do all of that. Yeah. Uh, mainly because I just don't have that surge capacity in tanks. Mm. But, but, you know, I, I don't have to do a spirit run, if you will, every every time I do. Like, I don't have to do it like that. Right. You can I have set enough it surge aside capacity. And, and, yeah. Yeah, and like some gets broken off to like, oh, okay, is this going to be Blanc or is this headed for barrels? Mm -hmm. What do you, what is, like how many, I know you probably have this in a spreadsheet somewhere, like (laughs) how many bottles or cases of rum come out of one truckload of juice? Loaded question. Depends on the time of, uh, time of the harvest, right? There's, you know, okay. the harvest yeah, starts out okay. and then it, like, it peaks at the, the sugar and then kind of drops down and plateaus. It also depends on how efficient I am at, in our distillation. But I kind of average it out 
it's close to about 10 barrels worth. Okay. Wow. Right. A truck. Yeah. So, right. Doing two trucks a week, you're talking about around 300 barrels. Yeah. So I'm trying to give people an idea of, you know, I think a lot of times people hear new American distillery and you guys aren't brand new, but, you know, relatively new compared to Jim Beam. They automatically assume tiny, small, you know, maybe they have 20 barrels aging right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Y'all are atypical in that your capacity is much, much larger than that. Well, it's part of the reason I want, I mean, I want to come here. I think my wife said it best. She's like, it's like craft, but it's not. And that's not derogatory to craft. I just. Right. I I didn't have it. I want to build everything that we do and everything that we implement is scalable. Yeah. And I always wanted to build it like that. Right. So if we could put one at a mill or have our own mill. Right. Would I distill it the same way? I don't know. I might introduce a stripping column, but I don't know. Give me a chance to fuck around. I'll find out something good. <laughs> right around like, and find out. As they yeah, say. right. <laughs> well, yeah, it's popular now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Like, uh, you know, I have my friend who's a, a brandy maker. I'm like, oh, yeah, he he has an Armagnac still. And I'm like, yeah, I'd like to distill it on that, I think. Right. But I also want to use a Sharon Day. So there's all kinds of things that I want to do that I yeah. can't. But if you're building for efficiency, but everything would be like, okay, I built this system that you just execute within these boundaries, whether it's where you're getting the cane, how you're fermenting it, how you're making the low wines, how you're making the high wines, how you're aging it. There's boundaries that can expand to whatever volume you want. Yeah. You mentioned selling it a little bit, and I don't think we're going to dive too deep into that. But I did want to ask you one specific question that I saw on the bottle label, which was what what went into the decision to have the vintage or the harvest, the year of the harvest on there? And why is that important, especially given that I've heard you talk about creating consistency across the batches when it, in my mind, usually when we think of vintages or harvest, we think of differences between annual releases. Fair enough. Um that is, we'll only really do that for Blanc because, okay. right, there's no oak involvement. It's just right. rested in stainless steel. And there is variation in the cane. Like the cane this year is different because we had the late freeze last year. Mm-hmm. So that really created a lot of dextrins. And then we had the drought this year. So it's like a perfect storm of shitty sugar yield. So how does that affect? It probably affects my yields mostly. Because mm-hmm. uh, how much you get out of it more so than flavor profile. Y- yeah, right. Exactly. So like 2020 harvest and 2021 harvest and 2022 harvest Blanc. I, I think I might be able to pick them out, but probably not. Yeah. So putting that harvest year on there because it is it is right like it's only it's the only product that I'm like I set that right. boundary on. It's true, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. I set that boundary on like I don't give a shit when it comes to our age expressions. I'm like I don't whatever harvest it came from do, doesn't matter to me, right? right? Because it's it's I'm gonna use that jump that shark thing, right? It's done that. It's in the oak. There's it's past that point. It's it's evolving in a different way. Mm-hmm. But I think the blanc is neat to have a vintage and. There might be subtle differences, and it'd be cool to. I like to put them up next to each other, and it's a way for me to make sure I'm staying with that consistency. Right. Right. I'm like, well, okay, are my methods keeping it to where I made in 2021 to 2022, 2023? What, yeah. Whatever. I- I can kind of see that now, actually, also. It's kind of, well, number one, like you said, it's true. It's a single harvest, so you can put that on a label and and have that information as part of the what's made this bottle what it is. And that doesn't mean you're you're gunning for or trying to produce a different product every year. It just happens to be what is happening that year. And then in your mindset, you want to get a sufficient level of quality across the board as well. But there is going to be subtle differences, right? So I, I get it from where you're going at it now. And if it is wildly different, I have an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Yeah. Well, I, I also think it, it it communicates a little bit the agricultural nature of the right, products, right, you know, to right. someone who's buying it. It's yeah. this is something that is is really tied to local product, uh, you know, yeah. plant production. It's something that came from here from a specific year, and I think there can be a an appeal to that from a consumer yeah. standpoint, you know, it, it makes it feel a little more special than something that's right. mass produced from 
a base material that is just ordered from wherever, you know. Yeah, at any it's not time. mass produced. It's not craft. It's somewhere in between. Yeah, it's somewhere in between. Right. I'm like, you know, I strive to be like the less Claypool of the rum making. Right. <laughs> <laughs> A lovable weirdo who maybe is cranky. Um, uh, I wish we could. I wish we could get a little Primus soundtrack on this episode. That'd yeah. be perfect. But you know, they the whole vintage thing. It's true. The, the agriculture aspect definitely went into it in the selling and marketing. Like there's definitely there's a there's a thoughtfulness of that. We always intended to do that, and then. One of my friends, he said, he's like, yeah, we need to teach people rum is made from a plant, not an industrial byproduct, mm. which is a little too harsh and derogatory towards <laughs> rums that I like. So I don't fully adopt that yeah. narrative, but I understand what he's saying. Right. And yeah, but I mean, like the tie that. So when it comes to the age expressions. I can't really put a vintage on there like that. I can put like a blending vintage. So if I have, for instance, I know it was 1030 or 10 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> but that's a great time to smell things. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah. Hmm. So right here I have um, what we're calling aged gold. I know we, I danced around. I'm like, well, VSOP, I called it that. I called it ESB. I called it a bunch of things. I think aged gold right now is like Jeremy aged gold. Yeah. Which is, you know, a blend of, uh, I think about 35 barrels and it has yeah. nothing less than two years in it. All ex bourbon cask that we hand selected from sections of the warehouse. The team and I, we literally sat down, flighted to like a few flights a day and we're like, we picked them out like, well, this barrel is exceptional but maybe we should let it go or this barrel is not mm -hmm. exceptional. Maybe we should let it go or <laughs> either one of those things. And okay, well, it's part of the blend and that's where the blending comes in. Right. Yeah. So we did, we have that it's all resting in stainless now, but this particular thing that's in my glass right now, I actually used soakage water to, to gauge it to the proof that I like. Um, but is, is soakage water like water, water that you is, yeah. put in empty barrels? It's what I so I empty my bathtub and then I use that water. No it's essence of uh, Zeno. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's called <laughs> gross. Um, <laughs> Regage water. There's a lot of words for it. A lot of big producers do what, the, what we did. So I'll just tell you what I did. Um, so we harvested those 35 barrels and we fill them up with water about one third of the way we palletize them stack them in the warehouse leave them for about 30 days pull them down flip them put them back up leave them for 30 more days then i harvest all that water okay. it comes out about 16 and a half 13 percent alcohol by volume interesting uh, that water and then i use that water mainly to proof down in barrel of barrels that i have aging or queen share barrels mm -hmm. like a lot of the queen shares that are like three years plus there wow so i'm dropping the proof in there and, and doing that but i had some left over and i had this aged gold these stainless steel tanks full of this getting ready for processing and packaging and and everything and i was like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna add a little of this regage water into here so i proofed it down from i can't remember where it was it's like 106 from 106 to proof to 92 proof with that regauge water and it's nice but my whole point of that was i set guide rails of what this age expression will be right number of barrels don't matter that much and then it was like just nothing less than two years mm -hmm. new american oak right so there will be more variation in that even though i'm trying to work that out with blending and then there's the whole mixing vat things for my next age expression that's still waiting on that not old enough but, yeah, wait, can we, can we talk? I want to, I'm glad you got into aging because I wanted to bring it up because you have a much different approach to aging than I think a lot of American rum producers do. And I'm sure listeners took note when you mentioned the word Solera earlier, because so often, you know, in rum nerd circles, it's al it almost can be a dirty word sometimes because they associate it with brands that put out deceiving age statements and stuff like right. that. And, and John and I were just talking, uh, we were yep. recording an episode earlier this week and we were talking about like, there's nothing wrong with 
the the concept of an act like an actual Solera and blending and everything, you can do really, really cool things with that. And I love seeing places take kind of, you know, inventive ways of creating blends and things. And um, one of the things you told me, I think the first time we talked about your your aging program was you wanted to get to a point where you had these larger mixing vats that you could put a bunch of rum into and uh, you wanted to bring in a bunch of French oak and, 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 you know, do a lot of cool blending stuff. And so I wanted to just see kind of where you are in that process. You mentioned you're still waiting on the vats. Like, where is that? Mm-hmm. And, and can you just give people an idea of what that system, your ideal aging system would look like? Sure. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't have, yeah, I definitely have been quoted like, I don't love American oak. I left, definitely don't love new American oak. Mm-hmm. That's a phrase I say a lot. And that's, I do, I drink a lot of old granddad bottle and bond. I fucking love American oak. Shut up, Zeno. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. But um, I, I don't run it with my rum. Like, it's just a different okay. spirit. doesn't hold up to it. So mainly I have all American oak now. But the, the whole plan was always to have, yeah, they're like, they're not huge, but they're big. They're like 6,000 liter French oak, limousine oak vats. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they're ex-coniac vats that are get like kind of refurbished. The reason that they're 6,000 liters and not bigger is because they can fit them in a shipping container and put them on skids. I don't have to pay a French cooper to mm-hmm. come over and rebuild them, and then it won't leak forever in a day. So the whole plan is we have this age gold expression, which will be nothing less than two years, ex-bourbon cask what I call first fill, right? Like that's that, that life, right? That life cycle of that program and, mm-hmm. you know, different parts there. Now those barrels that get emptied, get regauge water, they get filled with old rum, right? I'll, I'll empty it, put in there, put new rum. Like the, I, pl- I play a little barrel rum roulette because I fucking hate paying for barrels. Mm, yeah. Um, and I can reuse them. There's a lot of good life into them until there's not. And then I don't know, someone can make a planter out of it. I guess that's something <laughs> someone does. But the whole plan with the vats are the vat will be nothing less than, say, two years will go into that first vat. And you always put two-year product in there or three-year product. We will put some queen share in there, too, as a blending profile. Um, And that vat never gets emptied. It only gets topped off. Yeah. Right. So we just kind of like you just set age like, okay, requirements with their age or section the warehouse always top off this vat and then we'll pull some out for this blending vintage to call it like whatever we call it that that other aged expression but i don't have old enough stuff for well i'm getting close after this harvest i will Mm -hmm. and hopefully those vats get put in place at that point but it it had built in a system of consistency which is great with solera but it's also there's a real value to it you're getting some really old interesting spirit that you'd never be able to make any other way. Right. Right. So one of the better products I had, so originally when we did age stuff, and Will, I don't know if you tried this. We had some one year. We pulled stuff at one year. We pulled like, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 barrels. We had it in stainless steel for almost an entire year. Okay. We were going to release like a one year. Mm. And we filled those barrels back up with i can't remember with what anyways the, I, I could i'd have to look at the spreadsheet now but like we we <laughs> filled those back up and like you reuse them and there's some really nice notes that comes out of the liquid that was in there a matter of fact i sold a single barrel that had some that one year then when that was put in you try not to put old liquid in new oak you kind of try and keep them at the same age oh really oh yeah, right. it's like that. a try and like it's a it's a very esoteric, romantic French approach. I think there's some teeth to it, though, too, when you get into oak tannins and extraction, because nothing turns me off more than, like, that bittery biting a stick when you're a little kid, green twig. Yeah. Tannin astringency. Yeah. So some of that might be good if it's a really light element, but, like, when it's overdone, I hate over-extracted oak. Mm. I hate it. Um, but we played that game. So like we took that one year and I'm like, eh, we went back to it. I'm like, eh, we never released it. So I was like, let's put it back in barrel. So we did. And it's in barrel right now. I think it's in some third fill barrels, maybe or second fill barrels. So when I say first fill, it's always ex bourbon. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, right. So like, and it's or X whatever. It's just not. It's first. It's not virgin oak, right? Right, right, right. Which I'm not adverse to that virgin oak. If it was toasted, maybe I would do something. But even if that, it was French, maybe not new yeah. American, right? Yeah, I love. I love. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love Hungarian oak. Actually, it's like. Uh, uh-huh. So how I got into making alcohol in the first place, my dad's best friend, one of the people who's like your name, Sino you know now. She's a winemaker, generational winemaker. And we grew up in Pittsburgh and I used to get grapes with him real, like we get them in the morning and we made wine. And that's how I got into distilling. First thing I ever made was grappa. Um, awesome. It was, it was like rocket fuel. I might still have some somewhere, but anyways, you, you know, we used a Hungarian Oak for a lot of the wines cause very similar to French Oak, a little more aggressive, but the price is different. Right. And the next door neighbor was Hungarian. So he just happened to to keep Hungarian oak barrels. No, he's like, he's this awesome Hungarian engineer, Gabor. I freaking love this man. He grew the best like hot peppers in his yard. Oh, nice. Yeah. And he introduced me really into Slivovitz. And he built, we made, I call it Pittsburgh champagne. Uh, (laughs) So we have riddling racks. Like, you know, the whole basement of this house essentially is a wine making lab making thing mad scientist it's yeah it's fun also i'm constantly cleaning it because this guy who's like a dad to me is not as organized as i'd like him to be but we had <laughs> we riddled this high acid wine and these french riddling wax we forgot about it for like five years and then gabor was a machinist he got like a cooler like an igloo cooler like an ice chest and he machined he drove it out and machined things to fill a bottle so you could disgorge when in pittsburgh you disgorge when it snows with rock salt to depress the freeze point and make sure that so that's yeah. totally not about rum but uh wait what is disgorge i'm still caught up on this what does that mean um and so a traditional method of champagne you know it's carbonated that's why it's effervescent yeah right so to get that yeast block out of there to get it clear what you do is you depress the freeze point and there's lots of ways you can do it they depress the freeze point, and as you're riddling it, you get that yeast sediment. It comes in the neck. You kind of turn it every once okay. in a while, and then you freeze it, essentially, and it's like an ice block freeze neck, and the pressure, you pop a crown off, and it shoots that ice out with that yeast, and you have Holy shit. champagne. Yeah, so look up traditional method champagne, Yeah, which is actually, people are like, what do you drink? I'm like, yeah, I drink a lot of rum, but I would drink grower champagne. I, like, champagne is my favorite thing, but that's what... The rum is the perfect marriage of my whiskey background, my wine background, yeah. and being a fucking weirdo. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't. I don't think you know. I, I don't like to judge people on appearances, but I think when people see you, they wouldn't automatically think huge champagne guy. Oh my god, the massive like it would be. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Love yeah. it. I love champagne. I just was you know. We're just talking about I, special I, I, club. I'm remembering yeah. now. What, what what's the name of that place in Charleston that mm, is famous mm-hmm. for serving the champagne? Leon's. Leon's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Champagne yeah. and fried chicken. Champagne and fried places. chicken. Yeah, yeah. And, and oysters. Yeah. Right? Like, what else do you need? Yeah, I mean that Pittsburgh champagne. That was one of my favorite things. And I say I made it. You know, my guy, my dad's best friend is guy like my dad. He made it mainly. I was along for the ride, but uh, yeah. you know, disgorging in a cooler with snow with rock salt is the most fucking Pittsburgh champagne thing ever. <laughs> I love and then it. I, that sounds amazing. And I remember I was friends with people that owned a beer distributor because Pennsylvania is a weird state when to buy alcohol, or at least it was back then. And uh, I was like, hey, guys, I made this thing, and I got some fried chicken, and we were in the back of a beer distributor <laughs> drinking a bottle of champagne and eating a bucket of chicken. So when I found Leon's, like, you were like a, de- a decade later, I'm like, Shit, this, is- this is a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> this is the concept I've been searching for. Yeah, uh, right. I mean, like more legal for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, you can judge how I look or how I talk, but uh, yeah, I love champagne and rose, effervescent wine. Yeah. yeah, come on, cool. Forget about well- it. Yeah, I guess t- talking about champagne gives me a perfect jumping off point to something I wanted to make sure we got time to discuss also, which was the wider rum scene in Louisiana right now. And I know you've been talking about, and maybe this is from your champagne background, some kind of regional designation for Louisiana rum. So 
what's the story behind your drive there uh, for that? And what value do you think comes from that? And, and maybe kind of more, more importantly is where are you at with that becoming a reality? Um, uh, all, great. I would love it. How far are we? I don't know, man. That's politics. I'm many things. Politician is not one of them. Um, there's, I'm, I'm very much involved in that, but I'm not leading that charge. Mm-hmm. What I really want, I think what I really want is a classification in the TTB that gives me some differentiation, right? Because right now you can have my rum and Kohana and Oxbow and Bacardi all on the same shelf and they're all white rums. Yeah. And technically that's accurate. And JM and some Claren. Right? Paranubes. Right. And, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So yeah. there's like, okay. So, you know, getting a designation might be a little bit of cart before the horse. Mm-hmm. But I don't know which one's going to come first because mm, I, I don't know how that all is going to work. I think there's a lot of po- politicking in that that well, I just and- don't have the face for. <laughs> you got a face for Pittsburgh champagne. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. um, well, there's, there's levels to designations too, right? Because there's a group of producers can get together and be like, Hey, we want to come up with this designation, like mm-hmm. something like empire rye, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure. Is, I'm an know, Halo rye. Screw empire rye. <laughs> I'm an Halo rye. I'm from Pittsburgh. Right? There you go. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know all the whiskey designations. Okay. Yeah. I'm out of my element talking about yeah. that, but you can have something that's producer led like that, where it's just like, we come up with this stuff and we have like a an emblem or a you know a phrase that you can use to describe it Mm -hmm. that we have some kind of ownership over but then there's also shake yeah 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 you could also go a level beyond that and have like a an actual regulatory standard which is like bourbon or something like that which has you know stipulations in the ttb you know in the federal code of regulations and all that stuff and that's where rum has absolutely nothing in the u.s federal code right like if you look up you can look these up online for all the different spirit categories. And if you, you look up whiskey, it's like, you know, two, mm-hmm. three, four pages long of all the different types of whiskey and like, you know, the rules for them. Basically mm-hmm. rums is like a little paragraph. And then a mention for a cachaça, which somehow got the U S to, right. you know, recognize right. that, 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 that is distinct. So yeah, there's well, it's the whole agricole conversation too. Yeah. Right. Like, mm-hmm. Right, and I'm adamant never calling that because I don't make fucking agricole. I don't, I don't make it there. I don't make it the same way. Like it just, it's very influenced by that. It's also influenced by Barbon Court and what the yeah. hell is Barbon Court? Right? It's not rum agricole. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So, and you know, it's also influenced by cognac, right? So, I, I did say too, like right, cognac wasn't cognac until it was cognac. So right. I think both of those things that you said have to happen. Where my interest is, is like building those gutters. Like, well, it has to be made in this place, one harvest season, blah blah blah, distilled this way, blah blah. blah. I like those things because I'm a producer. Mm-hmm. So getting that categorized, and I think right, you know, people will say like, where's, where's bur- where can you make bourbon? And like, if you ask the general public, what are they going to yeah. say? Kentucky. 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 Right, right. And there's a premium yeah. on Kentucky bourbon, right? Like, you can make right. the same liquid, but if you make it in Tennessee, it's $2 cheaper. Yeah. Right. So I think that, you know, rum has an opportunity to get to that place, right? And I think Louisiana is great on that. And we are working on it. There's like three or four of us, five of us that are coming that have this conversation. And we keep it going and we're trying to move it forward. Then you get in like the side that I don't like is like, what do you call it? The marketing side, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So, and by that you mean like, is it Louisiana rum? Is it, or do you come up with some a yeah. descriptor like rum agricole, for example, which doesn't have the sure. name of the place in it necessarily? It's more about but, the the origin, I guess. I mean, I think that people should be like, I, I want us all all ships rise, right? So yeah. I want Louisiana. We should be known for rum. Like, for me to make whiskey here, and trust me, I have whiskey in my warehouse right now. I can do it. We can do it. I love whiskey. Fine. It doesn't make a ton of sense here. It just, I think we should be known, and we should put ourselves on the map for rum. Like, it makes sense. I'm like, I'm still super enamored and passionate about, like, we have this beautiful raw material that is so underutilized and so misunderstood. And, like, yeah, you got to educate a consumer, but... 
it's like innovative without being innovative right like you know i said i call it a like the aged gold thing like well that's you know we look at like what are we influenced from like there's spanish influence there's french influence right so i'm not going to call it you know esb or you know vsop right because right? mm-hmm. that's not we're american i'm an american yeah. do i sound non-american i sound pretty yeah. fucking american right so <laughs> you spell it r-u-m by the way uh jeremy yeah it's not yeah. r-h-u-m yeah yes i do and uh yeah, it, the, you know, the four of us or five of us that are in that, we don't all agree on that all the time. Um, oh, I stepped on into something there. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I mean, I, I don't give a sh- They know how I am. <laughs> do, you know, I, do I strike you as someone that pulls punches? You're not, yeah, you're <laughs> not holding your opinions yeah. close to the vest. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, this is how I, like, even if I do, like, my stupid face just tells you how I feel about everything <laughs> all the time. So, I, especially with no beard now, you can't yeah, hide yeah, it at all. Can't hide it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mainly grab a. I grow a beard because I have dimples, and I'm like, I'm a 40 year old man. I can't have dimples. Yeah. Um, just have sweet old ladies pinching my cheeks. Um, <laughs> that doesn't happen. Uh, no, I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> everywhere, uh, everywhere you go is Zeno. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, it's weird. Before beards were super popular, when they were pretty popular, but I've had a beard since I was like, you know, 23, like that yeah. big beard. Mm hmm. You know, when I was like 24, 25, people used to go and like reach to grab my beard. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> it was are a very you novel doing? concept. It was, and... it was mostly dudes. Yeah. Right? Like, which is <laughs> fine or whatever, right? Maybe and, like, you helped this... kick off the beard craze. So many and, guys were coming up and, and feeling it and just being like, I got to get yeah, one of these. Yeah. I own beards. Let's say that I own beards. <laughs> um, a guy who doesn't have a beard right now, really. But, uh, you know, it's funny. You know, I have a lot of, there's, people of color and like i'm in new orleans like shit that happens with our hair all the time I'm like oh yeah it fucking sucks like yeah. why are you touching me people right yeah as, as as a policy i have a policy don't don't just touch people you don't know it's, it's yeah it's it's usually not cool yeah i mean that's pretty common sense right like whatever i was i was stupid. in a movie i hate theater. people and love people all at once it's the I, weirdest thing i was in a movie theater a few weeks ago and a guy like tapped me on the shoulder in the middle of the movie and I like almost like threw my popcorn in the air. I was so I was like, why why the fuck would you just tap me on the shoulder like that in the <laughs> middle of a movie? Like I'm trying to watch Oppenheimer here. Come on. Yeah. That's, yeah, right. I, which I had really wanted to see in theaters, but you know, I got a sixteen oh, come on. month old. So uh, okay. You get a pass in that case. Yeah. 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 So I, I love that. I would love for it to be like, oh yeah, kind of like what Kentucky is to bourbon. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's what I wanted. But more importantly, what Calvados is to Calvados. Yeah. Right. Do, yeah. You, you hit on one thing, which is, you know, Louisiana has other types of rum other than cane juice rum going on. Do you think more Louisiana distilleries are going to continue to get into cane juice rum? I mean, is that a, a thing happening in your mind or do you know of or do you think you're you're really it right now? Um. Well, I mean, besides the people that are doing it, I think the people right. that are doing it are seeing it's a risk, right? Because there is education involved, right? And I don't, I don't, it's not a, it's not a familiar it. flavor profile to right. the right. average American right. drinker. Right. So I think that more people like Thomas, who I think you guys talked to at Sugarfield. Yeah. I talked, I talked the to light, He's leaning uh-huh. in and right. Like, you know, Olivia and Oxbow, they see mm-hmm. it and they're doing it. So I think we'll all grow. Um, as far as new people coming on, there is a learning curve to it for sure. There is a logistical like, uh, yeah, yeah, how you get it, right, yeah. where you're getting it from, right, right. et cetera, that's, et cetera. That's the whole so, thing. It's exactly the same as molasses, except everything's different, right? That's yeah, <laughs> right. Well, and then like the molasses here fucking sucks. Yeah, right. It, it's it's the, the molasses here. Is, I, I hate it. Right. I hate it. I hate it just because they're so damn good at making sugar. Right. Mm. So the, um, let, let me rephrase that. The molasses, where I was going to get it in their process, I did not care for. Because right. it had um, so much of the natural sugars removed, extracted from right. it. Right. right. So I talked to, you know, Zan was here for um, Tales? Tales of the Cocktail. Yeah. We hung out a few times, which, you know, I freaking love Worthy Park and all yeah. his rums. And I mean, Zan is like, Mr. Fucking Personality. He's a, so. he's a great a great hang. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. We're a little bit yin and yang in that regard. Right. Like, yeah. I, I'm grumbly miserable, and he's like bubbly <laughs> happy. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm ready for the buddy movie already. Yeah, yeah, cop right. movie. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but no, I love them to death and love their products. And it's everything. And we talk shop all the, and you know, I was just, I was like, it's crazy. Right. And like, we just make so much money and margin on sugar. And like, when you talk about Louisiana, one of my favorite things to tell people is the, my mill, they barge it to Domino. Yeah. Right. And Domino refines it. And they're, his, and the, my, the guy at my mill sells, he's like, he's like, my, the mill I work with, <laughs> they they said right, yeah. I don't need Rivers calling me. Like, what'd you just say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much not mine. But uh, he's like, yeah, they sell to Walmart. So I'm like, you can buy a bag of white and refined sugar off the shelf at Walmart, or a bottle of Cherami rum. Came and from the same, it's made from the same plant. That's pretty. That's, yeah. that's pretty neat. Yeah. So in that regard, though, like they make so much money. I'm like, yeah, you know. And Jamaica still makes a ton of money off of sugar. He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, what's holding it? Like, how's your molasses? Like, you're doing it specifically for the rum. He's like, yeah, we are and we aren't. He's like, your technology is just so far advanced. And our margins are so high in mm. sugar that we're never going to catch up. Mm. So they have a, you know, a built-in streamline of good molasses that they, they're able right. to do that. And, you know, like, to me, if I were to do it, I'd want more control. I'm like, okay, I'm making my molasses with intent. To ferment right. and right. distill it, kind of like like Mount Gay is is starting to sure. do now. Yeah, Abs- absolutely. They built their own right. mill. Yeah. Right, that makes perfect sense. Right, but that's not what we do here in Louisiana. Right, yeah. it's for sugar. So, I'm I mean, like, the, well, let's like, do it the, this way. Let's get more like, upstream. Right? The economics of the sugar industry are not set up for rum, really. Uh, for molasses right. rum, like molasses rum has to kind of like work creatively around that. I feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, right. which I mean, to an extent you're doing with the juice as well now, cause you know, you're coming in there and getting it. It's, it's, it's different. Like the ideal is to get to a point where you're growing your own cane and use, you know, just grow it for juice, use the juice. Um, like you sure. might find at a place in Martinique or something like that. Yeah, sure. Maybe that, that would be okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That, I mean, that just like gives me a ulcer trying to manage all that. <laughs> But uh, no, yeah, absolutely. I would love the mill and the distillery to be at the same place. And, you know, the farms are right there. I mean, it, there's so much cane. It's the best going down there. Like when I did a couple of weeks ago, because the cane's about ready to harvest and you're just looking and you're like, okay, yeah. I, I Every time I, you know, I get annoyed when I'm not making the rum and I got to do other stuff like business stuff. Yeah. That, makes us money um mm-hmm. and i'm like i hate this and then i go down there i'm like oh yeah this is why i'm doing it <laughs> then i get somewhere in the middle of harvest i'm like what am i doing i hate this <laughs> you need, you need, uh, you, need and I'm sad. you need variety it, you you thrive wearing multiple hats mm, yeah 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 well and i also like the, even like doing this what i did with soakage water and proofing that town i like to do I do like little one-off things like that. I'm like, well, I wonder what this is like. Yeah, so, yeah. naturally did I send inquisitive. You, yeah, yeah. Did I send you gin rummy, Will? I don't think so. Oh, oh yeah. wait. Did, did you use some of your barrels that so you I had a, I had a barrel aged gin? We had a barrel aged gin. I'm like, let's just put some blanc in there. Not new make blanc. Yeah, just, we had some blanc left over, I think. And like the barrel leaked real bad, but we got I don't know some of it out of it. I'm like, oh man, this is kind of weird and good. It's like a weird way to make a spiced rum yeah right? yeah yeah it's not a spiced rum at all I, it's, yeah i'll never sell it never make any of it i don't even know if there's any i think there is some left it's weird i don't uh-huh. even know if i like it but it's cool <laughs> the other thing i've been obsessed with is i like i like tim's coffee liqueur a lot oh, like yeah, coffee yeah. coffee and rum i'm like man i want to do something with like blanc and some kind of extraction i haven't figured out like some kind of i want to do a turkish coffee liqueur Ooh, with Jeremy oh, wow. blanc yeah, that's that's what I want to do. But I don't have time to do it. Maybe this year's harvest blanc. I'll do something. That sounds awesome. Yeah, we'll try that for sure. Just you know, yeah. Tell us when. Yeah, I love coffee. Yeah. Right, I love coffee. I love rum and Turkish coffee, like cardamom. I'm, I love it. It's gonna be yeah. I, I have do it on Kickstarter. We'll a, there you go. It. We'll do, we'll do it yeah. live on Kickstarter. Yeah, you guys, you guys can pick a private barrel. It's it's only one barrel, so you only have one. <laughs> <choice>. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, I want to hit a couple more things before we wrap up. W- one of them is actually the the last time you, Zan, and I were all together, we were at the ACSA Spirits Competition. 
tasting through a whole bunch of American rums. And I'm not necessarily talking about those rums specifically, but we just kind of talked about Louisiana's rum scene. Um, when you look more broadly at what is going on with rum across the United States, what do you, do you see anything that excites you? Do you see anything that like you wish you saw less of what's kind of your just estimation of the, the, the amorphous non-definable category of American rum right now. Very much in its infancy still, right? Yeah. Like we could say that at, at very least. And there's the whole, there's like the whole colonial, like the privateer right. stuff is right. they do what they do. And it's almost a different spirit to when I make. Um, like I think there's some legs to that and doing it that way. And some historical things without getting too sticky into history because it's not a great history in rum. Sure. Um, but then you have people like you have like this the rum collective and like Chicago, and there's people that are taking more risk with rum, which I like. Um when you say risk, what do you mean like funky fermentation, like creative? Sure. Trying to make rum for us and as opposed to the people that Mainstream want just a market. rum and coke. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Which like really is on your your neighbors. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Andrew, yeah, yeah. He he's always yeah, that's push the limits. I love that. I think that's good. It's good for growth. Even if they never make anything good. I'm not saying that they don't. Andrew makes plenty of things that I like, but you know, other people that are doing if you take that risk, you're gonna learn something. Even if it was, actually you learn more when you don't like it. Um but I, I think that that kind of growth is happening. There's also more rum specific yeah. distilleries happening, which mm -hmm. needs to fucking happen. I agree. Like, I can't stand we're like, yeah, we have a whiskey, we have a gin, oh, yeah, yeah, we have yeah. a single malt, we yeah. have vodka, we have rum, and I'm like, so what do you care about? <laughs> Right. Well, some, sometimes Dollars. that's, that's sometimes that, yeah. So, sometimes Sorry. that's owed right. to economics, where like right. they need something they can sell immediately. You know, white whiskey isn't the easiest thing to sell, so make a white spirit sure, yeah. people are familiar with that kind of thing. But to me, then fucking source it, man. Like, mm. yeah, <laughs> it just, just feels like, like they're putting whatever against the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah, that I gotta get that vibe right. Yeah. Like, and it's. It's kind of like when you take the homebrew approach, you're like, oh, yeah, man, I did like this, you know, Brett C. Saison <laughs> bottle conditioned with wheat and oats. And I'm like, okay, can you make a Pilsner? <laughs> <laughs> right? <And> like, <laughs> right. So uh, there's. <laughs> It's good and bad, a, a certain approach, because I don't want, you know, the general consumer to drink uh, like, oh, an American rum, mostly small producers now, right? Yeah, right. Like, oh, this, someone went a little too esoteric. It's, you know, the molasses wasn't good and it's not a good product. And they're like, well, shit, crap, all American rum is craft rum and tastes like this, which right. is not true. It's not right. true. I mean, I, I try I'm to great. tell people I, like you could try 20 American rums and they could all be bad. But you've only tried like maybe like five percent of all the ones out there, sure. <laughs> even at that point. So sure. it's you know there's just so many little small operations doing stuff that it's it's hard to find the the precious few that are doing a really great job because they are out there. Yeah, I mean, I promote the shit up, like Tim. Tim makes rum that is holistically different than the way I approach rum. Yeah. But I don't know someone that's more that cares more about it and more neurotic about it than Tim Russell. His rum, he is constantly trying to improve. And then on his white rum, that's what I love the most. It's mm -hmm. his white rum, which the the you know the Bud Light of rum expressions, um, <laughs> without the controversy. I was gonna say yeah, that's a charged concept right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah stupid people. Um, right, but like. Yeah, I mean his rum is is it's great, and the way he does it is his approach. He is, will build the rum culture, you know. I I love their their white their white queen share couldn't be different from your white queen share, but um, yeah. they're both great. Oh yeah, right, yeah, very different. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Tim hates all my rums, but that's fine. <laughs> I don't care. Um, but uh. I, I, I think there's there's some interesting things going on there. I think there's interesting with um, people blending. 
right? And sourcing from different places and blending. And if I were to do it again, if I were built from the ground up, I might source some rum and blend it to a profile while I had stuff aging out. Do you mean blending with your own distillate or just blending all sourced distillates? Sure. Um, (laughs) Before I was making my distillate, I would probably blend all sourced stuff. Uh Um, But I always wanted to blend. I I want to actually, Zan and I have talked about it. Like I want to blend with some stuff like people that inspire me, which, um, you know, obviously Worthy Park's one of them. Yeah. Uh, Barbancourt is a big influence on me which a lot of people have polarizing positions with them. I'm like, ah, like even, even we do. I think Will and I have polarizing positions yeah, on we've, that. We've, yeah, we've, we've gone back and forth on our yeah. Barbancourt court five star opinions. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's for what it is. I don't know. It, it's, it's pretty in like in their process and their methods. I like it. Even if it's not the best rum or your favorite rum, it, right. I respect a lot of their approach. Yeah. Absolutely. And I thought it was okay. Like, there's some choices that I made that I'm like, well, good enough for them, good enough for me. Sure. And so, like, I'd love to do something with that or, you know, but blending with that, it's like, no, we're American, right? Mm. So mm-hmm. we should make American rums. And, like, that's way down the road if we were bigger. I, more importantly, I would like, it. yeah, I'm going to go and be in Jamaica for three months making rum there. And they're going to come to new orleans during An exchange the program and That's make cool rum idea. with me yeah i'd rather do that because it's about the people right that would right. be awesome rum. yeah right. yeah yeah and like that's what i'd rather do than just straight up blending liquids but i'm saying if i built one from the ground up that people want to start a distillery i think there's no shame in you know buying bulk product from different places and blending to a profile and like yeah these are rums that inspire us while we're figuring out how we're going to make ours mm-hmm Right. And you can educate people on what rum is supposed like what you're aiming for, basically, or not necessarily mm-hmm. like I want to make rum exactly like this. But, you know, here's an example of what great rum can be, because even like you, you, we talk we talk about cane juice rum being a kind of slightly esoteric thing to the average mm-hmm. American drinker, like actual good quality well-made aged rum is is like an unknown thing to most american drinkers as well so you know being able to show them an example of that even if it's not your rum necessarily can be like a really great thing for educating people on like the potential of what you're making so what about aged cane juice rum like now that's a yeah even more of an uncharted right like there's american aged cane juice rum but i mean I look at it so a long time ago and I was at Oregon State. I went, there was a place called Del Alma and it was like the fancy restaurant in our college town. Mm-hmm. And I would sit at the bar and I made friends, the guy named Kin and rum. I drank rum. It was fine. It was like, it was on there, but it was more into whiskey and brandy, especially being in Oregon. I love fruit. And he was like, oh, I'm like, would you get Kin? Anything good? And he lined up Neeson, three different expressions of Neeson. Uh-huh. And it's like, that's when a light bulb went off for me. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. Rome is uncharted by this like and i mean that was probably six seven years six years before i ever made a drop of rum yeah mm. right now like never because i made whiskey right and i did that thing right and then but i always thought that i was like oh yeah and, that, and that's with the rums that i drank right i mainly i like fresh i like i like agricoles yeah right but i also love i fucking love Super estuary Jamaican rum. Yeah. 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 So we all like do. rum nerds do. Yeah. Rum exactly. Nerds. Yeah. Well, the first time I interviewed you about Sheremy, which was a couple of years ago at this point, mm-hmm. by more than a couple of years ago. And I asked you at the time about making that change from vodka to rum. And you said we're either ahead of the curve and really smart or it's the worst fucking decision we've ever made. So I wanted to do a check in on where (laughs) you think you are. You you probably don't have the complete answer yet, but on the spectrum of ahead of the curve and really smart and worst decision ever, where do you think you're falling right now? I would never fancy us, especially myself, very smart. Uh, (laughs) um, Maybe ahead... uh, Right place, right time. I won't even say ahead of the curve. Okay. I, I think 
I'm doing everything in my power to keep it going and keep it growing. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of that is, you know, since you've talked to me now, like we sell in Chicago, we sell in the Bay Area, we sell in Minnesota. Yeah, Um, really been branching out there. Yeah, yeah, right. And it's like, I was like, own your backyard. And I'm like, yeah, you should. You you should like own New Orleans. And I think our reputation is New Orleans. Probably people, you know, I'm the share me guy as much as mm-hmm. I am Zeno, just like everyone in my company is the share me guy. Right. I think there has been, I'll give you, uh, so here's my example. I got a random email from a guy named Harold. I believe his name was Harold. I don't know. He signed it with a meet very many Harolds. No, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, right. Um, a Primus song, Harold of the Rock. So, uh, That's right. <laughs> another Claypool reference. Um, <laughs> but, uh, he just emailed me out of the blue and I don't know. I mean, you can get my, my work email from uh, several different places and just said, Hey, I'm in Chicago. I go to my local Benny's. I buy like two or three bottles of the time. Share me is my favorite spirit. And it's like, the aroma. Awesome. he's like, well, the aroma. Cool. He's like, yeah. And I was like, cool. So I, you know, I emailed him back I was like, Hey, that's awesome. Thanks. H stuff is coming out. So there's like that kind of micro mm-hmm. interests. And then I have people that want to buy tankers full right. of my rum. So I think we're doing okay. Yeah. It needs, I will say this, the brand need, we need like a refresh. We need to be louder. Right. We just Do you mean in, a, in appearance or in volume? Like you, you need to be doing a, a, a podcast uh, interview every single day. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know if they want me doing, it, but Yeah. <laughs> I think that all of that, right? That's the expensive part though, right? Like the visual identity needs to meet really what it is and who we are and what we're trying to do. I I noticed that. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I noticed that the, the, the kind of the, the brand is giving off something that is similar to what I would say something closer to the wine industry in terms Mm -hmm. of the vibes it's giving off. Now that's Mm -hmm. just my personal opinion and maybe that's not the opinion of me. No, no, but I totally uh, agree with you. Yeah. I mean, is that what you're going for? It sounds like with your background, maybe it was initially the way that you all wanted to go, but maybe now things are starting to differ or maybe there's as you some, expand. Yeah. There's some element of that for sure. There's definitely mm-hmm. an element of like that. Um, to elevate it, it is a premium product. Mm-hmm. However, mm-hmm. and you know, Josh, like, guy, it's like my partner there. It's the, the marketing guy. I'm always like, man, he's gonna be pissed that I say this. I don't get whatever. <laughs> fuck you, Josh. Um, right? Like, so right. I think that it just needs to be. It just the rum is more fun. Rum, we I always want it to be accessible. Yeah. So yeah. it's a premium that's accessible because, I mean, look at what happened to the secondary market of whiskey I and mean, some rums now too. It bleeds over, right? But like, you know, if I have my druthers, you know, we're not gonna sell anything over a hundred dollars. Right. That's like a hundred dollar bottle would be like the best thing you ever get from me. I mean, I, that's music to my ears as someone who, you know, we talk about rums that are great and rums that taste well. And then we're like, well, the bottle's bottles, $300. Is it worth that? And it's, it's such a loaded question because people will pay different things for spirits. But if you do want something that is going to be truly like widely accessible, you know, it can't be anywhere near that price point. Which is then a conundrum, especially for newer producers, because you have to make money. You have very high costs, so sure, and you have to be premium, right? Like, yeah. it's like what makes something premium is simply a price, right? That's it, really, right? It's not the liquid, it's not the label, or anything. But you know, if you kind of get that whole picture, all of our pieces aren't quite there yet. Like, I want, I want all kinds of swag, right? Like, I want to be allowed, or right? like we are clearly passionate about what we do, yeah, mm. and I want everything to reflect that and you can kind of see the way we talk about it even on the back the, the back like back copy is good like passionate in that regard it's just a little why i mean it's great i don't hate it i love but we just need to be louder and as we're expanding in new markets and we're going to release this age expression and you know if this all happens it's a matter of money right you got to pay for that i'm not a graphic designer i yeah. you know i'm not a marketing guy either so maybe i'm all wrong so who, I I make the liquid. That's what I'm in charge yeah, of. Yeah, we'll and, keep making but, good liquid, right? And then we'll we'll, we'll crack yeah. this nut somehow. Right? Um, yeah, yeah. But it, well, like selling it to you guys is easy. I can sell it to you guys because you get it. You understand yeah, it. But I need to yeah. sell it to someone who doesn't know, and they can just look at it quickly. Right? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean that's. That, I think. I think the to an extent the whole rum category or the 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 producers in the rum category that are trying to sell 
honestly made premium products are all trying to figure out how to do that, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of drafting on whiskey, which yeah. I don't really want to do, right? Like, I mean, some of it we're going to do innately. Like, it's just what it's going to happen. Yeah. In my background, it's going to happen. But it, it just, it's not like this age expression that I finished that glass at 10 in the morning. So, good job, guys. For <laughs> um, we kept you long um, enough. Yeah. I, I took it to, to Cure and I asked my, my, my friend Gina Hoover, is an amazing, she makes amazing cocktails, which I have huge respect for people that do that. And, and Liz Kelly, they would work at Cure, which is you've been to Cure, Will, right? Like, I, I, yeah, I think that was, I think we did go by there. Uh huh. I had a Jeremy Dacry there, I think. Yeah, sound, yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> but like, I took this age product and I was like, hey, look, I don't know how to sell this because sure, the people that are going to drink it on the rocks, fine or neat, great. That, but like, what kind of cocktails? I need this, you know, every bourbon bro without alienating people every bourbon bro and and collector and basic bitch Scotch uh, which is, knob. basic bitch is not gender specific i'm not that guy so right. basic bitch is anyway. a lot of ways i'm a basic bitch um, so so like i need them all to be able to approach that and what kind of cocktails like without drafting too much on whiskey uh, the eccentric cocktail so um right just yeah, it's, just, it's, just it's a tough you slog. want to do more than just like a rum old fashioned or whatever Sure, but then I look at like what whiskey sales are in the whiskey craze. I'm like, maybe we just need to do rum old fashioned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we we started this uh, interview. I can't even remember if we were recording yet or not. But when we talked to you, you kind of mentioned that you're going into your busiest part of your season here with the harvest coming up, uh, and that you were uh, gearing up, you might say, for for that busiest time of year for you. So I wanted to ask, uh, as we kind of close things up. Now that you're on the threshold of this next harvest season, what, if anything, are you doing differently this time around and why, if so? Um, I always love the good big pauses before because it tells me you're really, really digging into it and thinking. Yeah. I mean, like the guide rails that we like, the expressions that we make only get minor tweaks, right? Based on what the yield is like. Yeah, but the cane was like fermentation is the, one of the more consistent things that we keep. The distillation is where we made tweaks, where we broaden the range of where we're making cuts. If you want to put it like that, like mm-hmm. we could do that or or tighten that range depending on what it is. So if there's more ash this year, we might need to tighten the range, and then that affects what queen share comes out to be. So those kind of things kind of happen organically almost yeah, yeah. but like mm-hmm. at, in, in process right the bigger things are that they're like okay how much blanc should i make compared to what i plan on aging right because blanc rests three months in stainless i can sell that quickly right. right so that's the bigger approach to it and then honestly it's just how do i drive efficiencies if i can make 10 and a half barrels or 15 barrels which sometimes those things happen how do i do that what am i doing differently so we actually we have changed a little detail just the way we rectify even our new make like what goes in a barrel we used to not run a deflagmator at all on that Mm -hmm. and that was like the key difference really between blanc and new make right Sure, but I can get the same difference and stretch it out and get a better yield if I just slightly run that deflagmator. Okay. Right. It's just how much reflux you're 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 forcing, mm-hmm. which is kind of you know the artistic ter- interpretation, if you will. But yeah, Davey really was like he was adamant about that. He's like, yeah, I think I'm like okay, yeah, we can do and we did it and like and then I've also some done some double straight double pot expressions, which I'd like to do more of those, but the geometry of my still in and of itself forces a lot of reflux so mm. it wasn't vastly different than what we do with new make gotcha but those kind of things like it's like okay blanc versus age and then age i'm like okay how do i get the most yield without sacrificing don't be out of my boundaries right of what that is and re- really the boundaries are like yeah cut proof composite proof range yeah temperatures right like there's a lot of but it sounds like it's you're not, honing, right? You're honing this process. You're not creating a new knife. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. But like where like Blanc should have never fucking existed. Right. Like the first year, <laughs> I was like, but I was drink we were drinking new make white. We're like, we should make a, a white 
expression. I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. But if we do that, I'm going to rectify it a little harder, make it a little more approachable. We'll be like, you know, raw cane juice starter kit for people. I, I, and, I like that. I like that way of talking about it. And I think sometimes people hear that and think that it's like talking down on it. But I don't see it because if, if you take Jeremy Blanc to a rum nerd who, mm-hmm. you know, is drinking Paranubes and Claren and stuff like that sure. and they taste it, it's going to be much i don't like i don't know if tamer is the right tamer, word but yeah. it's just yeah. more subdued you know not as you know really crazy kind of flavors going on one of the things i like about that is it does make it a really good introduction to a cane juice spirit yeah. to someone who's yep. newer to it and also sometimes when i want a cane juice rum i want something that's just a little more laid back you know yep. um that isn't right. like everything Punching turned to the face yeah like every mm-hmm. flavor turned to 11 you know crazy stuff going on sometimes i want something that's just a um yeah a little simpler i guess um the daiquiris and tea punch man like that's there's like it like the, the blanc and now the blanc i love i mm-hmm. mean i love, like they just and a daiquiri it's it's so easy to drink and yeah know, mm-hmm. it's a billion it's, degrees here like that's because explaining someone like oh this is a fresh pressed cane juice rum <sighs> Okay, I need to explain that without explaining that. Yeah. And get you to drink that is step one. Yeah. All right. So if I give you Rum JM, for instance, Rum JM White, it's a great product and everything, but like it actually has this like dried vegetable flake note that you, like you remember, I don't know, I'm 40. So like when I was a kid, it used to be in a spice cabinet and people used to put it on omelets and shit. I hate it. It's like dried vegetable flakes. It tastes as appetizing <laughs> as it sounds. John, do you remember like, this? I, I think I do. Yeah. Does it, yeah. it almost looks like fish food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But so at any rate, there's this one note and that's only in their white that I get like some of their age expressions. I actually prefer more, which is weird because I usually prefer. Yeah. I was going to say it's a little backwards for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, like I, I knew that would be too abrasive, too many grass notes, mm. too much bitterness. I'm like, yeah, just tighten up. So that's how Blanc came to fruition. And now right, like it's, it's what's out there and it, it it's great. It like it captures a wider audience. And right, like the starter kit right. thing is like, oh, yeah, there's this. What are what about you know Labatt and mm-hmm. all right, Paranubis, right? And like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then yeah. right, get, get as weird as you want. Or what about, yeah. you know, share me Queen Share? Or you don't sell any of the new make unaged, do you? Are you you have you sold some to bars maybe? Nope. No, I haven't sold any. Okay. No. No, I haven't Just sold Colton any. Colton takes it all. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he does. That's what Colton likes to drink. Um, it's what I like to drink too. I don't take as much of it as Colton, though. <laughs> but he, you know, we there's similar products uh, that are that are on the market that are in package, ready to go out of the warehouse. That use a variation of that. That was like a collaboration with a. They are. It's called Turning Tables, actually. Oh yeah, the which, organization in New Orleans. Yeah, the organization. So we did a run with them. I don't want to talk about it because, like, I don't want them to make it about us. It's theirs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's very close to what New Make is. Let me awesome. just put it to you that way. Yeah. And I love. I'll drink the shit out of that. Plus, it's it's great for them and get the exposure of their organization. Yeah. It, it's huge in my city, and I'm like, I'm very much Pittsburgh is like the biggest. You ever met someone from Pittsburgh who isn't proud of being from Pittsburgh? I, Probably not. Yeah, I, I feel like yeah. The Pittsburgh people I know are, they don't talk like, down on Pittsburgh. It has an identity. Pittsburgh has a big identity. It's yeah. real. It's Mr. Fucking Rogers, man. It's like, I'm like, I'm like Mr. Rogers. with that. <laughs> Exactly um, like right. in, in yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've worn yeah. a cardigan for this entire interview, yeah. which yeah. I thought was weird given, you know, it's still pretty hot in New Orleans. Took off but, your shoes when we yeah. started. It was yeah. exactly the same. Yeah. And there's a whole neighborly community thing. And the only other place I've lived in the country that's like that is New Orleans. Mm. So like working with, uh, you know, someone like them who's an organization that's helping the community do like that is that's what i live for right yeah. right that's awesome and it's great i'm excited for their product to come out that's awesome mm-hmm. well we've covered a lot of ground kept you for a good chunk of the day when i know it's your busiest mm-hmm. time of the year we have one more mm-hmm. thing we want to cover but it's very fast it is our rapid fire segment of the podcast a traditional yes traditional ending of the show my co-host john prepares a list of zany interesting questions zany is a good word for zeno yeah yes. yeah there like we go it. alliteration so, yeah we love alliteration <laughs> on the rumcast so what happens is i put 
a quote unquote 60 seconds on the clock. It's not really 60 seconds. It's a little longer than that. And we try to get through as many of these as we can. So normally awesome. I ask people if they're in for this, but I'm, you know, totally you're not going to say no. Yeah. Yep. So John, are, uh, are you ready to go? Oh, I'm super ready. I, I feel like this one's already, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like the answers are going to be flying fast and all over the place exactly like I like it here. So. Wow, you're, you're, <laughs> really, we're gonna... you're putting the pressure on him over there. So, <laughs> Oh, I'm going to put some pressure. We're going to do this because Zeno, you, need more you got this. Yeah, yeah. I've, <laughs> yeah that's, go, that's go always a good start. Go fill up your glass again. It's no, it's, no. it's 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 afternoon now. It's twelve oh five, so you can That's have right. a second glass of perfectly rum. legal now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, John. I've got All right, let's... sixty seconds on the clock and go. Let's go, Zeno. Neat or on the rocks? Ooh, rocks now. I live in New Orleans. Okay. Yeah. Column. Call that's true. Column, pot, or blend? Depends on my attitude. <laughs> okay. I like it. Aged yeah. or unaged? Most of the time unaged, but there's always exceptions to a rule. Okay. Uh, I'm not even going to ask you molasses or cane juice. I already know where you're going to be molasses. on that. Oh. <laughs> what the fuck? Come on. Um, your favorite U.S. state making rum right now that's not named Louisiana? Pittsburgh. Not a state. <laughs> the state, the state of Pittsburgh. <laughs> the state of Pittsburgh. All right. What distillery have you visited that gave you still envy? Ooh, still envy. <laughs> Any number of the ones in Calvados with all their Charentes mm. and their direct fire, those those give me give me still envy. Excellent. Also, also, yeah, um, you know, Tim Tim has a great uh, Tim Rose Pittsburgh. He's got those direct yeah, fire no. stills. Yeah, yeah. 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 getting yeah. a lot of love up there in Pittsburgh. Yeah. All right, yeah. um, all right. Are, are you secretly huge Pearl Jam fans there? I just no. have to ask this. Okay, because no. I mentioned Jam, it a, little, Pearl a while Jam. back. Yes, it, like you have Porch Jam, Pearl Jam, and Jeremy sounds a lot like their hit song, Jeremy. Jeremy. So I just felt like, I was like, wait, is there a new rum coming called Even Flow at some point? I just felt like, uh, you know, that could be a thing. But all right, we're going to skip past that one because we got I hate Pearl Jam for the record. I freaking <laughs> hate Pearl Jam. Yeah. <laughs> ah, um, I, I heard on your podcast that you all play a little bit of Dungeons and Dragons. Well, so um, we got to get the name of the podcast in there. Still, still, still talking. talking. Everyone still subscribe, talking. please. Yep. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons a little bit. You know, what, what class do you typically play? I've never played Dungeons and Dragons. That is just Brian. We, he, <laughs> okay. I'm just the comic relief making fun of him. <laughs> Although I would totally play it if I had the time. But, you know, you get older, you trim your hobby tree. So... I don't know, is like is an ogre a class? Because I feel like I'm an ogre. Well, you definitely mentioned now that you said you don't play it. I know you don't because you said ogre as a class. So we'll, now <laughs> you've outed yourself as a non-player. Um, Sorry. But no, you, Damn it. You, you totally play distiller. That could be your class. Uh, we'll, we'll give you that. Um, all right. How about this one? If AI were to somehow be able to create a rum from scratch, what rum currently on the market do you think it would mirror? <laughs> this is dangerous for me. <laughs> Privateer. Oh, oh wow. Interesting. <laughs> With Just the kidding. Hands up. Just kidding. Oh, all right. I hope uh, Andrew listens to that. No, no, not at all. <laughs> which rum they, you know, it'd be like Don Q, right? Okay. Which also I really like, but yeah, it's Don Q. <laughs> Something in that vein. Okay. Right. Like, yeah, um, we're going to we're gonna distill it very efficiently and right. put it in a frozen daiquiri. Well, P Puerto Rico makes the most rum in the world. So there you go. The AI arg algorithm is going to go from there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Your dislike for American oak has been well documented, even in this podcast. Um, <laughs> would you rather distill using molasses or age a cane juice rum in new American oak? Oh, shit. <laughs> This is a would you rather yeah, you for just this pick one. one. Yeah, I, I would rather you dis distill from molasses if I get to pick Yeah, more man, you really from. hate America. I mean, so it might be fair to say you're like the Baron Zeno to Captain America Oak. Uh, that's a that ah, you might actually know that reference. Uh, See, excellent. it goes right over. I don't get any of the comic book references. So if 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 you're wondering what it means, you know, I am too. I don't know. I just thought it was polite to laugh. Bar Baron Zemo, <laughs> Baron Zemo, guys, come on. All right. I just, I have to say, I find it a little strange. You graduated from Oregon State, you mentioned, which are the Beavers, right? But you hate 
hate oaks, but you hate oak, which is (laughs) super weird. All right, finally, let's get this thing back on the rails. I've heard tales of this huge, big annual crawfish boil event Mm. that you host at the distillery. Is it true that the secret to your recipe for the boil is pickling or marinating the crawfish in Cherami rum beforehand? No, I wish it was. I wish I could marry those two things, but it is a most glorious day this crawfish boil it's awesome i mean last year was the biggest one we had a lot of people and then we got like eight sacks of crawfish and it was just all day and people fill barrels which is like yeah it's fun filling a barrel and i'm like yeah great it's one less that i have to fill Um, i thought you meant they fill in with crawfish you're still talking about rum yeah they fill it with rum yeah (laughs) because we let it we let people do it because it's fun they don't experience right there's like i usually do that the beginning part before people drink at all or do anything like that you know there's a safety element to it everything is up to code yeah it's (laughs) well i don't know louisiana Uh, code (laughs) but uh (laughs) but yeah it's it's a great moment it's always like it's it's a sign of i'm like okay cool now i can take a breath i'm not up against the end of a harvest so but yeah there there is no crawfish spiced rum yet (laughs) <laughs> Ooh, and yeah, I've, I've seen like an Old Bay vodka or something like that out there. So yeah, maybe there's a crawfish boil of that out there. We're that all about have. ideas here. Yeah. Or maybe maybe you could do <laughs> yeah. some sort of like a like a pachuga approach to incorporating crawfish exactly. in some way. I don't know. Yeah, I hate all of these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> We ran through time a long time ago, by the way. So yeah, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. call it, but we're we're yeah. You made it through uh, with flying colors. Uh, awesome. you, you managed to not get John's comic book references, which which earns you a uh, a gold star in my book. So I feel less alone. There but, are dozens um, of us who get that. Dozens. I, you mentioned the aged gold. Is mm-hmm. that something that's going to be available for the people listening to this podcast at some point in the foreseeable future? Where how can they find that? I'm hoping to get a little a little of it out by the end of the year. The liquid's ready. Yeah, it needs packaging a little bit of water added to it and packaged but the visual identity is yes. where it's the only thing right now and then then it'll go but yeah it's i really want some feedback on it because it's a really uh i have no idea right you know i kind of want in there blind and mm-hmm. i really quite like it but you know everyone likes their own cooking how, how close is I, what what you're going to release to the sample that you sent me that we talked about several months uh, ago. Almost, almost, almost identical. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I really enjoyed that sample. And yeah. so, yeah. I, yeah, I'm looking forward to that release. Kind Actually, of that is identical. That was at 92 proof. Yeah, yeah that was uh-huh. it. I've stuck with that proof. I've gotten a lot of feedback from it. So, yeah, it's that. The one I am the one I drank today, the only thing that was different is that I used that soakage water. Yeah. Which maybe I'll do in the future for that expression. Mm-hmm. But hmm. mm, I don't know. It puts more American oak character in it. So, uh. Uh, but it also is like rum that was it, it was made from. So there's kind of, cause I do a little, I do a resting period after the barrels are harvested too. Yeah. So, but yeah, like if I had my druthers, I would have released it last month, but that's it. I'm hoping if we talk this time next year, there's, I'm, a, I'm we're much louder as a company. All right. Yeah. Right. Well, I can't wait to hear the more louder version of Zeno. Right. Yeah. It's like a Vitology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pearl Jam joke. There Actually, we go. I yeah. don't know. I just named a Pearl Jam right there. I really hate Pearl Jam. Really. <laughs> have you always have you always hated Pearl Jam? Like just from from the first time you heard them? So my brother's best friend, she really loved Pearl Jam. Uh, and she's like, Zeno, you love music because music is a like I wish I could do something with music, but I have no real talent. Um, <laughs> so she was like, you'll go to this Pearl Jam show with me. And it was at actually this place, the Civic Arena. Um, uh-huh. It might have been might have been called the Mellon Arena at that point. But I was like, yeah, whatever, I'll go. Music, right? And not a big Pearl Jam fan, but who cares? I'll go see. Anytime, I, pr- I very rarely turn down a concert if I can go. Yeah. Okay. So I go and we listen to like the new album on the way to the concert. We go, they had like a two and a half hour set. Yeah, they have right. long shows, right? And then she's like, she's like, you want to get a drink afterwards? I'm like, yeah, whatever. She really, you know, obviously, I drink. I'm drink. <laughs> and we go to this bar that has 10, a Pearl Jam cover band playing. And I was <laughs> oh, like, oh, no. And I was like, fuck this. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> We're done, like, so you just said you were overexposed, it sounds like. Yeah, is that, to something is that I do. 
to something I didn't quite like to begin with. Right. Right. Like, right. Uh, all it's right. like too much carrots. Too much if you gave me there. a bowl of cooked carrots, I'd, <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, I really hate cooked it's carrots. It's like it's like the you know, you get caught smoking a cigarette, so your your parent makes you smoke an entire pack. That was yep. you with uh smoking an entire pack of Pearl Jam, and now you never yeah. want any of it again. Exactly. I definitely <laughs> smoked an entire pack of Pearl Jam. And there's a very funny video. It's what Pearl Jam sounds like to people that hate Pearl Jam. Oh yeah. I, and if you Google it, a great it's Eddie Vedder impression, probably. Yeah. yeah. And then there is one that's also with red hot chili peppers. Very funny. I think I've seen that one. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have to check those out. That's yeah. good. All right. Well, on that note, we'll we'll wrap it up. We'll let you go. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah. It's thank great, you. So great much. to chat as always. Um, Thanks, we, guys. Yeah, yeah. We've we've mentioned your rum on the show enough times that we thought it was time for people to actually hear from you, hear what it's all about. So looking forward to seeing everything that comes down the road. Great, man. We're an open book. Like that's, you know, then like no, I'll tell you exactly how we do everything. Yeah. Right. Email Zeno personally. The email address is apparently easy enough to <laughs> apparently, guess. Apparently. And yeah. Right? yeah, it was pretty wild. I was like, this <laughs> took me back, but it was so nice that I'm like, all right. Yeah. Now, if I get one of those, it's like, you suck. You should stop what you're doing. I'm like, well, <laughs> what are you doing, inner monologue? Why are you emailing me? Um, <laughs> It's coming from my own address. Yeah, right. yeah. They're calling coming from inside from your inside house. Inside the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, fellas. Have a good Saturday. Yeah, you too. You too. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of the Rumcast. Thanks to Jason Zeno for joining us on the show, telling us all about Share Me Rum, the exciting things going on there. And hey, if you have thoughts on the episode or anything else going on in the rum world right now, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, host at rumcast.com. That's H-O-S-T at rumcast.com. Also, you can find us on social media, at the Rumcast on Facebook and Instagram. Always great to hear from you there as well. And uh, if you want a little more Rumcast in your life, we are on Patreon, providing bonus content, doing monthly happy hours for listeners and things like that. So you can find us there at patreon.com slash the Rumcast. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the Rumcast. But uh, until next time, we'll see you then.